you have sharing screen rights. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we are super excited to talk to you about our social enrichment program here at Huckleberry. Once again, I'm Kim Garcia. I'm a special ed teacher who teaches in the social emotional enrichment program at Huckleberry. The goal of the social emotional program is to guide students to be responsible for their own social emotional health and independently maintain appropriate conduct throughout their school day. So the classroom itself is co-taught by myself, a school social worker, and Kim Garcia, a special education teacher. And the students receive direct teaching of skills around social skills, emotional regulation, strategies. Um, and these are students who have been identified as needing extra support um, in their social emotional learning. And these students are provided re with a reinforcement schedule that we'll talk about a little later on. And each one is individualized for them. And then we also really hope to create a safe classroom for students to feel if they're having a tough time to come and um, take a break or check in with Ms. Garcia or myself, um, with the students in the social emotional enrichment program. Students are taught to advocate for themselves and we in increase their independence as much as we possibly can. Many of the students in the program have pair support, but we like to pull back on some of that support as much as we can to make them feel more part of their own learning and to utilize some of the skills that they're learning on their own without somebody coaching them how to do that. There's frequent communication within the program um, between home and school and then anybody that works with the student. Our mission statement is to promote the social emotional wellness of all students through fostering self-management and interpersonal skills. We have five paraprofessionals in the classroom, as well as a BCBA that supports students and consults with the team as needed. We rotate paraprofessionals between students to make sure that students are generalizing their information and their skills between the staff members. Um, so one component, component of our program is our check-in, check-out system. So students in the program check in in the social emotional classroom every morning, and they fill out a worksheet that you can see in the left-hand corner. And the first thing we do is we ask them how they're feeling. And if they happen to be struggling or feeling in blue or red, we problem solve ways to get them into the green to start their school day. And then we also problem solve any unresolved issues they may have had that morning at home or possibly the day before. They also set a goal for the day that they like to work on, and then we go over a plan on how they can achieve that goal, and we review any tools or skills that we've taught them um, to help them achieve that, that goal. They then come back to the classroom at the end of the day, and they review their points, and they're able to um, pick out a prize from a prize drawer. Um, we'll talk about points in a little bit. And we really, the most important part is we praise them on any positive behavior, um, and we talk about what tomorrow might look like. So they're always, they always know what's ahead. Um, and then if they are able to choose from the prize box, that means they are on track to being able to participate in our fun Friday activity. So our point systems in the classroom, each student is on an individualized point system based on four specific expectations that we're looking from them. Uh, these expectations often include goals and objectives from their IEP, as well as maybe just some behaviors we're kind of seeing pop up within the classroom setting or socially with peers that we want to just kind of target and work on. So every half hour, there's our little sheet up in the corner, um, students review with their para how they did with those four expectations. That really helps hold them accountable and recognizes their accomplishments. These um, points connect to our checkout that Michelle was just speaking about and they earn their prize box, which they are super motivated by. They love their like little tangible toys that they earn. So these points um, reflect their expectations and what they get to earn from prize box. And then Fun Friday, everybody loves Fun Friday. So every Friday, students reflect on their entire week 
it's really a place for us to encourage that. Even if you had a rocky part to your day, part to your week, there's always times and opportunities to turn it around and we really encourage um, turning it around. So students earn Fun Friday and that can include, you know, something as simple as just earning some extra recess time. The students also like to have special lunches with Mr. Fabriciano or Dr. P. Sometimes a movie day. Last Friday we made putty, so if you take a look at those pictures, you can tell that was a huge, messy hit. So we have our beloved snack cart. This happens every Friday, and it's not only students who are in the social emotional um, program, it is also any student um, in Huckleberry. It might be a student who might need some extra love that day, or they show really positive behavior. Um, by collaborating with classroom teachers, we're able to choose those students. Um, and not only does this help work on their math skills because they go to each classroom and sells the um, teachers and school staff, but they're really forming positive relationships with um, teachers and staff that they might not get to know otherwise. Um, it really helps to increase their self-esteem. Students are so proud to go to each classroom and kind of show off to the other classmates what they get to do on that Friday. And then what's also really nice is a lot of our staff members will pay it forward. Um, so the next staff member gets to pick out a snack based on what they paid for them. And it not only shows, it not only contributes to the positive um, school climate, but it really just shows our students how kind we are to one another. Another component of the program are our student mentors. So often I will take an older student in um, the social emotional enrichment program and during a writing lesson, we plan out an art project with very detailed step-by-step -step directions that the younger students can follow. Um, the older mentor students get to work on this art activity with the younger guys, um, and it's really a great experience to have that connection. It promotes positive self-esteem, encourages social skills, and then positive interactions with peers. Our little guys really look up to their older peers and then when they see them in the hallway and they're like, hey, that's, you know, so-and-so who made this turkey band with me, um, it makes them feel like really special, really important. So this is a great program. So we also collaborate with um, classroom teachers to incorporate some social emotional lessons in the classroom as a whole. So this is um, throughout the whole school where we push into second, third, and fourth grade classes and we um, have whole group discussions about some social skills such as just to list a few problem solving skills, some coping strategies that we can use in the classroom and outside of the classroom, and some self-regulation skills like taking those breaks when we feel like we really need to get out of our seat for a little bit and just making those positive decision-making skills. So just really reflecting back on some problems that we've had and what are the decisions that we made in that moment. Um, as a smaller group, we meet, uh, Mrs. Fico and I, we meet um, uh, with social skill groups. So those are called lunch bunches. Um, where we meet to play some um, interactive games and we read some stories and have fun activities. Like recently we did some arts and crafts for Halloween. They seem to really enjoy those um, and just have whole group discussions and reflect back on those, um, some problems that we may have faced throughout the week and coming up with some solutions as a group. Um, we practice coping strategies in this group so that we're able to transfer those over into the classroom and also throughout this whole school day. We practice some conversational skills, some play turn taking skills, and um, really identifying some, the, some problems and determining what the size of the problem is and how that should equal the reaction as well. So some of the de-escalation strategies that we utilize and we teach our students are listed here. Um, we teach many, many different strategies. What works for one will not work for another. So each student has their own toolbox of strategies that work for them when they are feeling that they need to use a strategy. So here are some of our little kiddos sharing some of their favorite strategies.
Did she mute? Is she muted herself? Yeah, it's because she muted herself, I think. sharing your screen is that Michelle sharing your screen you're not sharing your um, computer audio so you're only sharing the video can you just undo your share and redo it and check that box to share your audio while I figure out how to make sure this doesn't die I think if you just unmute yourself I think okay. that, and I, I just shared it down so let me know if it works okay here we go no. when I'm in the blue I like to use fidget or do jumping jacks When I'm in the blue, I like to use the fidget. Sorry. You won't let me play it. Okay. Uh, when I'm in the sad mode, I like to play. Drive, drive. When I'm in the blue, I, I like to draw and I tell them to mow up. with um, outside organizations such as family therapists and healthcare providers so that there is um, a homeschool collaboration and we can practice those strategies in school and also out, outside of school so it's really carried over throughout um, environments. We all, um, we've been organizing a Thanksgiving drive um, at Huckleberry to really help those families in need and we get the students involved by um, having them help us organize these baskets and collect items and sort out those donations that we have received from other families and students. So we just wanted to give a big thank you for everyone's support um, in helping our social enrichment program. Does anyone have any questions for us? Any questions? I just want to make a comment. Yeah, I think I'm on. I think, I, I think it was. It's just nice to. Obviously, these are students who struggle with emotional regulation, and I just like that the title is the Social Emotional Enrichment Program. So we're not going from a deficit model. Mm -hmm. um, that this is enrichment to um, to help them with probably the things that they struggle most, and because of that enrichment, they'll become more regulated and then more apt to learn. So. The title got me. I loved it. I thought it was really, really a great way to emphasize uh, such a positive thing about kids who potentially uh, really struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to keep kids in the schools, too. I'm imagining if you're dysregulated, you may have a difficult time functioning in a regular school and may have to seek uh, outplacement. So, so that's very impressive. Thank you. Thanks for emphasizing that, um, Jen. That was something uh, a number of years ago we started the program, and uh, it was with all of your help. So thank you for recognizing that. Thank you. Questions? All right. No all right. questions? Thanks, everyone. Right. Great job, Huckleberry. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. They did great. They did great. <laughs> So our next item is our student representative report. All right, so to start off with um, some events that we had in the past, um, just recently on Saturday, October 30th, we had the homecoming dance. So um, a number of students showed up from ninth through 12th grade and we all had a lot of fun there. Um, and then just before that, we had uh, the Friday or the night, the, really the day before at school, we had a lot of students come and show up for 
Halloween with their costumes on, so a lot of people were dressed up during that day. Um, into some administration stuff, uh, we have basically for referencing back to last meeting when I was talking about the lunch process, um, there's been a lot of improvements. So um, both staff and students themselves, a lot of students that may not necessarily have leadership roles in the school are now stepping up to like become bigger leaders and um, working to streamline that process. So um, different procedures are being made. We just got the like ropes put in place for people lining up in front of the lunch room. So that's helpful. Um, and a lot of upperclassmen especially who are kind of taking the lead and saying like, no, 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 get in line, don't cut, stuff like that. So, um, and also just trying to lighten the mood with obviously COVID is still lingering around even though we don't want it to. So um, a few things like we're trying to use different words. So saying the dining hall instead of the cafeteria or reserved seating instead of like assigned seats. So <laughs> stuff, little things like that. But well said, but well yeah. said. <laughs> reserved seating, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, a few benefits that we've seen from the reserved seating is that there's a lot of more engagement now than in past years. So like in the past, or at least last year, especially when the desks were literally separated apart and you looked like you were in rows and columns, um, people are talking a lot more at the tables and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with their peers. So that's good to see. Um, and then going away from lunch a bit, just wanted to talk about individual lear individualized learning time, ILT, which is kind of a new um, period that was put in place this year. So it's a 30 minute advisory period, um, kind of in the middle of the day. And every student at the high school has it at the same time. So in the past, we've had like flexes that are all at different times. So this makes it a little easier if um, students want to meet with teachers, they know that that teacher is also going to have ILT with their students. So they can meet, make a set up an appointment, and then kind of you're not interrupting class time or anything like that. Um, some other benefits, clubs can meet during those times. So if there's like the leaders or the officers of the club need to meet and plan for whether an event or, an, or a whole club meeting, they can meet during that time since again, they all have that block at the same time. Um, and then also just moving certain things like the loudspeaker announcements to that time rather than they used to be the beginning of second period so that way it's again not cutting into class time and Ms. Shady now can talk over the loudspeaker during that time um, to make any announcements necessary. Moving on to clubs, we have National Honor Society coming up on Monday, November 15th. Um, we're running a blood drive, so we're planning to donate 35 units as we have in the past of blood to the Connecticut Blood Banks. Um, and then also Unif UNICEF Club is currently partnering with a citizen from Tanzania, which they're working with to um, plan different developments and talk about um, locally owned homestay and tour company that this citizen is kind of in involved with. Um, and the students will create a website, fundraise to support his purchase of the items for the tours and homestay, as well as assist in social media advertising and they will develop environmentally friendly and con conservation focused educational materials for the citizen and his clients. And this was actually built off of a Fund for Teachers grant, which was received by Heather Bian Carey, the advisor for that club. Um, and she got it to investigate and support sustainable eco and ethno tourism in Tanzania and Rwanda. So that is everything that I have. Okay. Cool. Nice, nice job, Ben. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Ben? I have one. I'm just kind of going back to what you were saying about ILT time. Um, how are students liking that time, and how are they most utilizing it? Um, definitely, they enjoy the fact that it's all at the same time so that they can meet with the teacher if they need to. Um, going back to the social and emotional learning aspect, um, kind of like once a week, as we call a Mentor Monday, the teacher will check in with the students, and especially those that may be struggling or their grades are kind of low, they can check in and say like, oh, is there anything that I can do to help and stuff like that. So they like that part. Um, and then kind of just like some, some do use it as a time to get their work done, which is also helpful if they are caught, are all caught up and everything's fine. Um, and then others can meet with teachers to kind of have that one-on-one -on -one time while there's no classes going on. And you like that better than the flex generally? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of students definitely have appreciated it more because Again, going back to with flex, it was like you'd have a flex when a teacher has 
uh, class or during lunch or whatever, so it was hard to kind of coordinate with that. But now, since everything's at the same time, it's a lot easier. Great. Yeah. Any other questions for Ben? Thank you. No Thanks, Ben. Okay, written correspondence. Jason Mastropalo wrote regarding facility use fees. Aaron Scalera wrote regarding policies and procedures. Andy Correa wrote regarding the cheer investigation process and an FOI request. And Kim Rachel wrote regarding public comment. Okay, uh, approval of board minutes. I'll move that the board approve the minutes from the regular meeting on October 20th. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, the superintendent's update. All right, thanks, Rosa. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, earlier this week, we put a school message out to families. Uh, Dr. Sullivan asked us, or, or the health department asked us to send out a message from Dr. Sullivan regarding the um, five-year-old to 11-year-old opportunity uh, for teaming up with the New Milford Health Department for vaccination clinics. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this afternoon, uh, I sent out a another school message regarding our uh, part of our district communication plan, which is our coherence of communication, and really an opportunity to effectively and efficiently engage with our families um, uh, through uh, following the proper protocols uh, in the chain of command to make sure we could adjudicate issues uh, as quickly and efficiently as effectively as possible. Uh, so we wanted to get that out to everybody, and it's a series of flow charts that we find very helpful for uh, for parents and for staff. Uh, another thing that we talked about at facilities earlier tonight, and there's not a facilities report for this meeting, uh, but the CES um, part of the roof that's over the nurse's office and near the pre-K area was completed on Friday and Saturday. Uh, so that's great. There was a lot of leaking going on there, and we've rectified that issue. So we're really, really thrilled that that is complete now. And then finally, just uh, two highlights uh, from professional development yesterday. Uh, it was just an ex extremely positive day in general. Uh, I got to spend the morning with the pre-K to five team, and I really need to thank Mary Rose and Melissa and Maureen and the rest of the team uh, and Jackie Whiting uh, for putting the day together. Um, very positive, was able to share the news about our construction update that we'll talk about later uh, with Candlewood Lake, but bringing pre-K to five, the certified faculty together, it was really enjoyable to see everybody connecting and starting to team build and getting really excited about things. Uh, and then the other piece was um, under Mr. Post and Eric um, and Joan, the team uh, putting the Kronos time and attendance project together and doing a lot of training yesterday. There's a lot of training this week, but in general, we did a lot of training with our paraprofessionals and that's all that time and attendance and payroll work. So that's something we've been working on for a couple of years. And so that was another highlight. Um, that's all I have for my superintendent report. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I was just gonna say, I happened to see the email for the coherence of communication. That was really um, helpful and a good visual. I thought something that to help improve that would be to put the um, names of the people in those roles in their um, email. That would be helpful. The, the, yeah, that's something we can consider for sure, Joy. Um, uh, think about how we can do that. I want to be careful because it's, you know, a principal at one school is different for another principal at another school. So we'd have to almost mm -hmm. do it by school, but it's something we certainly can consider. Um, and I hope people find it helpful. So thank mm -hmm. you. You know, the visual, I think. Yeah, it was yeah. very helpful. Any questions for John? Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Um, subcommittee reports, we have none. So moving on to the consent agenda. I'll move that the board approve the items on the consent agenda, which are new hires and resignations. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. On to new business, we have the class size report. Um, so Dr. Ruby, I'd like to invite you up and um, we'll receive that. Good evening. Though I think you have all received the class size reports for this year. Um, looking at the center school report <coughs> with the um, BOE class size guidelines of between 17 and 20 per class, all 18 of our classes at the school are within the uh, BOE guidelines. And you can see on there the um, breakdown for preschool K and grade one. We have two preschool classes with a total of 38 students. The three-year-olds have 14. And um, that's a morning session. And most of the students in that program attend uh, three half days. Um, students will attend different numbers of days 
um, based on whether they're regular ed students or special ed students and what their IEPs um, dictate that they, uh, the services that they are to be receiving and how much time that takes. There are 24 four-year-olds currently. That's in the afternoon session and most of those students attend four half days. Uh, the important thing to remind ourselves of when we look at th these uh, numbers is that they change from day to day sometimes throughout the year because as children um, are uh, reach their third birthday, they go out of birth to three and into three and five to three to five. So if they're students who are receiving special education services and they reach their third birthday, they then are eligible to come into the program based on their birth date. Um, the same would be true for four-year-olds who are identified um, after their third birthday. So these numbers um, do fluctuate. This is the October 1st census. In kindergarten, there's, there are nine classes with a total of 177 students, and three of those classes have 19, and uh, six of them have 20 students. And for grade one, there are 167 total students in those nine classes, and you can see that two have 17, two have 18, three have 19, and two have 20. So it's pretty straightforward, as is the Huckleberry Hill report. Um, the total number of students at Huckleberry is 512, and None of the classes are below the class size guidelines. 22 out of the 25 general ed classes, or 88%, are within the class size guidelines of 19 to 21 students. <clears throat> You'll see that when you get down to fourth grade, where there are eight classes and 171 students, three of the classes have 22 students, and five have the 21. So those three classes in fourth grade are um, out of the range by one student. Um, and the other, for the other two grades, 180 students in second grade, all of the classes within the guidelines, and 163 students, um, all of the classes, uh, all eight classes are within the class size guidelines. So I think we're doing pretty well in terms of our uh, teacher-student ratio in, in those grades, but we will um, follow up with the recommendations from our earlier discussion on how to best serve those younger students and um, what models of best practice for paraprofessional use would be beneficial. Um, we still have Dean Renda here because his report is very complicated. Um, if you've had, hopefully had time to look at it, Dean, if you want to come up, um, if you have, I'm not going to read through this. You can see it's uh, quite involved because now we get into departmentalization and the students rotating through the UNAH um, specials. And you can see where we're within the guidelines and where we're not in the guidelines. And that's in bold on um, the first page of his report for his school, grade five and grade six, 19% are of the class sections are over the class side guidelines. And 30% in seventh grade, there are large sections. And 26% in grade eight. Um, I don't want to bore you with just reading through. I'm not going to read the charts, obviously. But um, based on your having looked at these, were there any questions that you had that were specific to Wiskineer? Um, and we gave you, um, as always, a comparison from year to year for the um, previous two years. Okay, that's what I was going to... Yeah, that's, if you look at the top of the, um, this is the format that we use every year, mm -hmm. that the chart that goes from page to page to page has the greater the course, and then the sections for 1920, 2021, and now the 2021 school year, and we provide, well, Dean provides the number and the percentage for the um, sections with regard to the, um, the t class size target. Hmm. And how are teachers finding the manageability of some of these larger classes? Well, actually, I didn't. Well, actually, this is a pretty good report okay. for class sizes. Yeah. Um, I think you'll, you could notice that in grades 7 and 8, there's yeah. larger class, obviously, 204, 200, so mm -hmm. you know, at least 10, 14, maybe more. 
The difference is in fifth and sixth grade, we have nine homeroom teachers, if you want to say, and 10th, um, excuse me, 10th, seventh and eighth grade, we have 10. But even with 10 at times, you'll notice um, that, you know, like if you, I, I think what you're saying is I look at fifth grade on the chart now, I'm on the chart. Yeah. And uh, we have seven classes, so it's more than we had last year. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, it's still, only 19 percent which is actually not bad at all compared to two years ago um the sixth grade is up again because that number is nine teachers where last year we had 10 teachers so that's where that number seems skewed a little bit but last year we had 10 teachers in sixth grade with 204 kids uh where this year we have um nine teachers with the 190 kids so that's where i think the number so well, even last that. year with more teachers though we were over for sixth grade yeah yeah but we were only over <laughs> four of the sections if you okay. look at the 2021 20, section mm -hmm. that's what that means this okay. is part of the magic of what they do at the middle school and high school <laughs> because and it gets tricky it gets tricky with certifications because we have teachers that are certified k6 and then we have the teachers that are certified 712 and dean and his team have to with the fluctuations in the in the demographics from great when we have a bubble year, et cetera, et cetera, try to move all those people around so that we, you know, don't lose teachers. We can't put we can't put people in classes that they're not certified to teach. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's So is that what happened here? There was just like a, sh a moving around of teachers? Is that why we're down a teacher there in six? Well it was really it's because of, of class sizes okay. with numbers. Okay. You know, again, we try to be strategic in, in that aspect. And because okay. we were down 14 uh, students, excuse me, and actually that number was even lower. We, we had, that was a, sixth grade is usually a grade that we do get more students come in. We have students from AIS come in. Yeah. And for some reason, that's a an, an average. I think I've done it over the years. I think it's almost an average of nine to ten extra students a year between AIS and, and other students. That's probably our largest grade uh, with differences in numbers. But, um, and then sometimes with seventh and eighth grade, you'll see some of the sections, it depends on if it's a high, you know, advanced math class, sometimes those are a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. It depends on some of our world language because we have French in seventh and eighth grade. But when we have a teacher that's teaching the French class, that means we have to have, there's uh, less sections for Spanish in there so that means that those numbers are they go up a little bit that's all that means any other questions on those i mean you'll see we do have a lot of zero percents yeah yeah like for our specials now, mm -hmm. now there's an example but you see zero percent for special mm -hmm. and that's because we have 10 at every um at every grade level well, at every grade, we have 10 special teachers, so at every grade level, you obviously have 10, 10 teachers. Mm -hmm. And one thing, if you notice, that I'm excited about is the, uh, um, where is it, somewhere in here, with the band and chorus numbers, they have gone up dramatically mm. um, from the past years because, obviously, last year they were down a lot, and I apologize, i got to find that for you. Oh, if you look at it, I think it's the fourth page. Yeah. Chorus, we're back up to 99, so we were at 152 couple years ago uh, we went down to 23 last year we're back up to 99 and in band uh, we were at 195 a couple years ago now we're back up to 146 Great. so up another 20 so that, I think that's a that's a positive mm -hmm. any other questions yes. all right. so I just uh, this is it's a hard job to do all the scheduling oh, and no. it takes a really long time and so we really appreciate the work that uh, Dean and his team do with this. Um, for the high school, uh, we had have a total, this is uh, the October 1st data, of uh, 904 students. And you can see uh, the way this is always laid out in this way by the uh, content area class, how many sections there are, and then how many sections are above the class size guidelines, which is 21. And you can see just right off the top with English, 49 sections, but 43% of them or 21 of those sections are above the uh, class side guideline of 21. 
and the largest class has 29 students and so that's a, a, a fairly large class mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've uh, since you got this on Friday if you had any specific questions about any of the um, any of the sections and what you're seeing on there social studies has a, a larger class with 30 students I think um, there are music classes that have uh, 49 students the PE classes the largest class is 29 students it, the other uh, interesting component we always get asked about uh, how many students are in what language and uh, that's provided here there are 557 um, <coughs> Spanish enrollments and 80 French enrollments. Okay. And Mark did prepare this, but Joel is here if you have any specific questions regarding this report. If we were to add, sorry. If we were to add teachers in order to address some of the class size issues at the high school, do we have the physical capacity to schedule them? In, in terms of rooms? Rooms and things like that? Uh, it would be tricky. Uh, I, I certainly think, you know, we're always open to suggestions and looking around and things, but it, there's no empty spaces, large empty spaces, but certainly we can get creative. Okay. Yeah, right now there's, it's like a, a full hotel. That's, <laughs> that's what I was thinking the answer was. No more reservations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How many students are enrolled in American Sign Language this year? Part, I didn't hear that. ASL? In ASL, how many students are enrolled in American Sign Language? I do not language? have, I don't want to make that number up. I don't have it. But we can get it because Jules has her talking computer. <laughs> <laughs> so that is one of our world language classes mm -hmm. and not mentioned. Right. I was just wondering, and this might be a question for a different report, but um, how did some of the new courses that we've offered over the last year or two fill, and how did that impact class size at all? We can get that information. I'm sorry, I missed the question. I think so, it's 28 for ASL. 28 for ASL. <clears throat> the new cl the new classes that we've added that we added in the past year, in the past two years. Um, can we get information? I don't want you to get it tonight necessarily. Yeah, not for tonight. Yeah, um, information like on how did they fill and it does that have an impact on class size? So how are they doing overall? The, the classes that were new, that added. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, like the past couple of years we've added a couple of new classes. Well, right? I know the research mm -hmm. classes have Tech class. been very um, popular. And if you ever have a chance to go to one of them, you'll wish you were in the class. Mm -hmm. They're really good. Okay, any other information that we can get for you? I don't want to put Jules on the spot since she didn't do the, this report, but we certainly can get you. We can get the um, this amended to have the ASL numbers on it, and we can find out about um, your question, Jen. Yeah, I think that's okay. It. All right. Okay. Um, don't go too far. Our next uh, <laughs> item is the EL by grade report. Oh, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> so you have your EL report, and uh, this year we have this is as of 1019 um, 104 students and you can see at center school there are six um, 16 students eight in each of the grade levels and the we have four total languages at um, center school when you get to Huckleberry there are 43 students um, now this is significant and you're going to be hearing about this in our budget um, <coughs> um, work this this year there are 43 students in grade 12, there, uh, grade 2 there are 12, grade 3 20, and grade 4 11. So there are nine total languages represented at Huckleberry, but if you look at Spanish, there are 20. 20 is the magic number when you're talking about speakers of a single language in a school. Once you have 20 students in a school, that speak the same same language. You are required. You are legislatively required to have a bilingual program in the next school year. So next year we will be required to have a bilingual Spanish program. What does that mean? It means that we need to 
advertise for a bilingual certi Spanish bilingual certified teacher and we need to procure um, curriculum materials and offer bilingual services to those students. So I'm not going to belabor that point right now because you're going to be hearing more about that when we get into budget. Uh, Wiskineer has tw 29 students and there are seven total languages spoken there. You can see that the highest number is in fifth grade with 15. Um, and now think about this for the future. When we have the pre-K-5 school, all those numbers are going to be added together. Mm -hmm. And more likely than not, the probability is that we will always be required to have a bilingual program from here on in. And so, is it a separate bilingual program for Portuguese and Spanish? When we, if we have 20 Portuguese, yes. Because you, you add the, the yep. oh, I don't know how many of the mm -hmm. middle school are in fifth grade, but that's yeah, we, that's we starting don't have that to get, down. that's going to start getting closer. Yes, so this is just something to have on our radar. And we, but yeah, from, we, from here on in, we will most likely in Brookfield have at a minimum a bilingual Spanish program at the um, at, yeah. at the Candlewood yeah. Lake School. And that was indicated uh, at our last meeting in the budget priorities. Mm -hmm. The Brookfield High School has 16 total students with a total of four language spoken there. And you can see the breakdown. So um, total uh, languages, when we look across the four schools, is 13 languages represented. And so your question, Bob, you can see that they're across the entire um, district. There are um, 29 Portuguese speakers and at the high school there are seven so if you subtract seven from 29 you would have 22 uh, K8 and then we'd have to figure out how many of those students which we obviously have the data um, moving forward we'd have to look at those grade mm -hmm. levels um, mm -hmm. in in the groupings of pre-k through mm -hmm. five so I would predict that somewhere down the road that Portuguese group is going to reach an, uh, an N of 20 in the uh, Candlewood Lake School because we do have a large um, Portuguese population in this part of the state. Any questions on that? No. All right. Thank you for that. Um, our next item is the homeschool report. This is the most exciting report you could ever want. This is a very difficult report to um, put together because um, parents do not have to respond to our inquiries and we are fairly diligent in um, the, it's done in the human, uh, human resources department in sending out the letters to people. Um, we, we follow the guidelines, the state guidelines, and currently, currently of current available data, so that's really a loaded statement, um, reveals that we have 35 students that are being homeschooled in our district. And they come, these 35 students come from a total of 26 families. And um, we send out the uh, notice of intent to families who we know were previously homeschooling or who during the pandemic we had people that were homeschooling, we sent them all the legally required letters. And um, some people send us letters saying, we're not filling this out. And that's the end of that. Um, we, they are asked to fill out you know, all their demographic data and what the grade levels of their students are. And you can see the breakdown of the grade levels. And then there are some people who will not tell us the, um, we had five people who filled out the forms but would not say the grade level of their students. Um, of note you sh that you should be aware of, we have a policy, uh, a Board of Ed policy that addresses um, the re receiving of a high school diploma from Brookfield High School and what the um, attendance requirements are for being a Brookfield High School student. So when we carefully look at the forms that get uh, filled out when they get sent back to us and when we see students that are in 10, 11, or 12, we additionally send them when, we, I, when I fill out the forms that I have to send back to them we write, write, I write, write on the form, 
and close, please see Board of Ed policy. Don't ask me what the number is. I write it a million times, but I don't have it memorized. Um, regarding high school graduation, and we give them a copy of that in the envelope so that they understand that if you're homeschooled for 11th and 12th grade, we're, we're not going to uh, graduate you from Brookfield High School. And that seems like pretty common sense, but it is not universally understood by people. So um, that's the information that we have um, from our attempts to collect data on um, homeschool children in, in the Brookfield Public School District. Questions? Remind me, is the number up or down from what we've seen in the past? It's about the same. About the same. Yeah. So even with the COVID going on, it's mm -hmm. about the same. Yeah, people came back. The, the, most of the folks who were homeschooling, just a, like one or two, and then we, we lose people. Okay. It's been fairly consistent. But I can't attest to the fact that this is all the children. No, I can't. Right, right. Yeah, I can't. We hear that we hear that speech every year. Yes. It's a hard thing. I don't it's want a, anybody to misunderstand thing. that. Yep. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Ruby. Thank you. All right. The next item is the twenty twenty two Cave Delegate Assembly Resolutions. Um, so this is just an action and potential motion. Um, so every year Cave has um, a delegate assembly. We are, as a board, we're members of CABE, um, which is, for everybody else that's listening, of the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. And one of their functions is to uh, lobby the state legislature um, on behalf of its members. Um, and so what I have sent you is what they sent to me and really the board. Um, including you know the uh, introductory letter regarding um, what the assembly will entail which is essentially a voting of their positions on several issues um, regarding state education so i also sent you the list of those proposed resolutions those are um, exhibit d and these are a list of the resolutions that have had substantive changes to them um, they're not all brand new resolutions they're resolutions that have been around but they've had some changes those changes are in bold um, but what will be voted on at the assembly is what you see under belief so that actual statement of resolution so if you see belief or if you see the word resolution that's the wording that is getting voted on at the assembly so for boards that want to participate in the assembly um, they need to elect a delegate someone to represent that board and vote on behalf of that board at the assembly which is on November 11th in Groton um, and so tonight was just to discuss the resolutions and if we want to elect a delegate um, that we would do that also tonight But who was planning to attend the, the cave event? I think you were. Yeah, so was so, anybody um, else? Nobody else expressed interest, but you know, it's you can every anybody can attend. Um, you know, it's not just the delegate who can attend. Um, any, any of our board members could attend if they wanted to. And Rosa, really, the purpose is to make sure that our local board is more connected to other boards and sort of yes. the state in general so we have more of a, a voice or and more hooked into developments at the state level yeah exactly and one of the things and the reason why I brought this forward to you guys was in in previous self board evaluations we've said that we've wanted to become more involved in the state um, education mm -hmm. process um, and I thought that you know when I saw this this was a good way for for us to do that And all of the resolutions are lobbying resolutions, urge, yes. urging the state to do it. They have an awful lot of things that are urging the state assembly to deal with. Mm -hmm. And most of these things, again, are their positions that they've held. But in recent, you know, over the last year, if any major changes were to be made, um, 
like for example there's a whole thing on remote learning um, so that became you know a big um, a big issue over the last couple of years so now there's you know an updated resolution to that And I'll just add that the other part that will be voted on is their consent calendar. So if you see this sort of like checklist, this is these are a bunch of resolutions that are positions that they hold currently, but they have not made any major changes to them. So they'll be voting on them as an entire sort of package um, because there haven't been any changes. So. Oh, I see. So this has been a standing package, and we're just updating and adjusting yes. it. Yeah, I got yeah. It. And I do have a copy. They they sent it to me, and I got it tonight too. But um, the actual resolutions that are in the consent uh, calendar. And then, how often would you meet? Just once a year? Yeah, it's oh. just once a year. And we're always invited, so I just don't. I don't think we've ever participated so you scan the issues there's not much controversial in what no. they recommend they're no. they're recommending no you know and most of the stuff i found was you know things that we've discussed things that we've um advocated for in our own community so you know it would be nice to have that voice at the state level as well and potentially get you know support from the Connecticut State Department of Education and, and the legislature in particular. things one at a time. Um, can I make a motion? Yes. I'd like to m move that uh, we elect uh, Rosa Fernandez as our delegate for Brookfield Public Schools at the state uh, delegate assembly, the CAVE state delegate assembly. I'll second. Okay. Um, any discussion on that? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, so then do you want to go through um, the approve we should probably approve the consent calendar um, those are again and feel free I can give you the packet but the list is that sort of look like a photocopy type of page um, those are the list of the their resolutions any that they're deleting um, because they've accomplished them in the legislature um, or other things that they will continue to lobby for but haven't changed their um, position on. I'm going to do this generally and then. The intention to approve this whole document or? So the first, the, the consent calendar would be these items. These yeah. are items that haven't, and I think that's probably the simplest one to vote on first just because these are um, positions that haven't had any changes. Um, so they are positions that Cave has took. Um, and I, if you want like the full wording of them, you can look at them here. Um, I would need time to do that. I don't okay. feel comfortable doing that tonight. Okay. How does everybody else feel about that? comfortable with a general uh, general directional okay on these or uh, I'd rather take uh, time to thoughtfully you know read through this and when is our next meeting so our next meeting will be until December um, so, so we won't meet again before we won't before. meet again before and that's you know the the, re the resolutions that actually have had changes those are the ones I sent to you guys last week 
um, because I wanted you to have, you know, a good amount of time to read through them. The consent stuff, I didn't even get until tonight. Um, And those are items that haven't changed. So even as, um, even at the assembly as a delegate, I will not be voting on each one of these things. They'll you just, just do it like a consent you, agenda? Yep, exactly. The yeah. consent agenda approval yeah. on things that have not changed or right. on all of them? On things that have not changed, we'll vote on it as a packet. And then what happens on the, uh, on the ones that have changed? Then we can actually discuss and vote. So uh, considering that we've received it, um, I would actually suggest that we authorize the chair to use her best judgment to represent us at the uh, assembly as these items are reviewed. And uh, I'm just not comfortable with that. It's a bit of a delegation, but it doesn't. uh, It's a question. I mean, as a group, do we we're we're going to be saying we trust Rosa to go in with a open mind and know us well enough to represent us? I mean, the only reason I say that is there's not anything really controversial in what they're proposing here. I mean, that's when you kind of read through these, and I and did. Yeah, and I do want you to look at them as two separate things. So anything that is new, you know, that those are the ones that I've that I've provided to you in detail, and we can discuss those tonight. We're not so going to take the time yeah, to go I, discuss them in detail. Right. I mean, frank. I'm confused on the deletions. Are, are they are the deletions replaced with anything? No, because those have already been. They lobbied for them, and they've accomplished their goals. So they're not going to continue to lobby for something that they've accomplished. Yeah, so the first deletion, it said proposed deletion accomplished in the 2021 legislative session. Right. The second one was proposed for deletion the issues already covered in the resolution and the consent agenda. And the third deletion was it's no longer a statewide issue. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'm confused about the detailed description. Yeah. Like 11... It's probably not 11. 11.2 21st century skills is listed here under regular calendar. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is where if we wanted to go through each one of those resolutions, and let's say you really don't like that resolution, and we as a board say we don't like that resolution, then I would say I would check no on this box, and then when I go to the delegate, I would vote against it. So on the consent calendar, everything on the first page is stuff that they've already mm-hmm. passed. Or, no, or, they're, or those are, they're not proposing changes. To. Right, right. So the only things we would really have to be concerned with are the looks new like are the things under regular, regular calendar, calendar that are outlined here, which are like maybe fifteen things. Yes. Mm-hmm. So is it is it worth looking at those 15 things and if there are any that, like I agree with Bob, I think really most of them are not controversial. I would feel comfortable having you represent us, but if there are some that we want to discuss, we don't, I don't think we have to discuss all 15 of them. Right, we could go to the ones that, right. Maybe there are some that we just need to get some clarity on or discuss as a group. Right. Is there anything that jumps out to anybody? You know, I looked through these and, you know, I agree with Bob. I don't think there's anything too controversial. I think these are things that we've lobbied for in our budgets year after year. I think they're positions we already hold. Um, It's just a matter of are we going to say that outside of Brookfield? You know, I think that's that was that's generally the purpose of of Kate is to bring board, boards of education together and say, okay, we're agreeing on the same things. We're doing the same things in our district. Um, you know, should we, as one voice, say that to our state legislature? All right. So let's do this. Let's just do this, and I'll help drive through it if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I will, re- and it's useful for the public to hear a little bit of what the what is being going on. I'll read the belief for the resolution, right? Not okay. all the explanation right. language. I think we ought to all lo- listen to that and decide is that something we could generally support, and then that'll give uh, you can take notes, Rosa. Mm-hmm. That's why I would, I'm doing it instead yep. of you. Yep. 
and uh, we can plow through 15 items in, in a pretty quick time, I think, right? And if we want to stop on any one of them, we can stop and discuss it, right? So, yeah. but if everybody's okay, we'll just move on and go on through the next one, so. Uh, so 11.1 .1 was creating educational excellence. I'm going to take this off if that's okay. Yep. Uh, creating educational excellence through economic, racial, and ethnic integration. The belief, CABE believes that each child must have equal access to effective, free public education and to the services of well-educated and skillful teachers. Boards of education working with state and local leaders and community members can play a key role in ending systemic racism. And there's a the variety of language below it. Um, so this is about creating uh, a, a balanced educational system. And we're already addressing this here with our equity community. We already have like this deeply this is, in our yeah. equity and, and diversity mm -hmm. thing. It so. sounds like, if I'm reading the explanation of the change properly, that this um, resolution was already in existence and all they did was add exactly. A under number two. Exactly. So we're not... Okay, so there's a long a long list for the public. Right. There's a long list of details and the ad was community conversations to build partnerships, understanding, and broaden support for diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Correct. And that is exactly what we are right. doing. Right. Yeah. So the integrated educational programs are already in there. Infrastructure is already in there. We're not yep. creating something new. I think I could support that that inclusion of what I just read, mm -hmm. that item A, because it's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm okay with that. All right. I'm just going to keep plowing, guys, if yep. that's okay. Uh, item number 11.2, um, the resolution, uh, the subject is 21st century skills. Um, there, uh, there, it's a long resolution that's urging the state and federal government to support programs and research that focuses on problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, and other high level 20 21st century skills that are important for success in global workplace. The state and federal government should support school district ca capacity to provide the technology and tools necessary to foster innovative learning practices, instructional methods, and a mastery-based grading system that bridges school and real-world experiences. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we talked exactly. about in our roundtable. Um, and uh, provide for greater personalization of education and prepare students for college and or career. Now the resolution change deletes this paragraph. CABE urges the General Assembly to form a competency-based learning committee comprising of sitting superintendents and teachers, school board members, and deans of institutions of higher education to develop pre-K to tw 20 mastery-based learning system that includes competency-based educational models to permit students to progress academically and that are not explicitly tied to a fixed amount of seat time as required under Carnegie unit system. Um, and the reason for the change is um, the, uh, the, the, it just uh, didn't need that last paragraph. Changes to learning models with online and remote learning will continue to be a higher priority than that, right? And then that's mm -hmm. very specific thing. So uh, I don't know, I don't, have a, I don't have a huge problem with that deletion because the first paragraph picked up all the things that we would want, Yeah. right? Okay, Agreed. any issues? All right. 11.3, remote learning. Uh, the issue was the need for a comprehensive online learning platform. The res resolution, uh, which is uh, just updated to uh, reflect current terminology, so it's just a terminology change. But I'll read it. It says, the resolution is that CABE urges the General Assembly to require the State Department of Education to develop a vetted, comprehensive, remote learning pl platform for um, offer the platform and courses contained therein at reasonable cost to districts and to provide training to district personnel to facilitate and assess student learning versus said platform. And the change, they changed the word online to remote and they, change, and they uh, deleted for students in districts, right? It just was a simple grammatical changes to me. Any issues with that one? Okay, 11.4. Um, this is about school climate, culture, safety, and security. Um, 
Let me just see what the reason for the change. Um, again, this is a long one, um, and uh, and it, I'm just going to I'm going to hit some highlights if that's okay. Yeah. Um, it it's it urges all school boards to address the influence of violence affecting children through school board policies, parent education programs, peer mediation student assistant teams and the school district curriculum to maintain an environment that fosters learning and growth to develop review and maintain safety plans that present that address prevention preparedness mitigation and emergency response and recovery and to address environmental health and safety risks as well as potential security breaches in the coordination with appropriate local state and federal agencies i don't think anybody can disagree with those three items and it just the I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the rest. It's urging state and federal government to provide greater resources to for doing this, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that they delete the only change is they're deleting this last paragraph that says Cave also urges the General Assembly to direct the State Department of Education to develop resources for teachers dealing with students that have experienced trauma. Um, and they recommend the delete the last paragraph materials have been developed for teachers addressing trauma it remains an ongoing issue man i i think i would love to have the state department of education develop resources for yeah. teachers I, I think i would disagree with that deletion hmm. anybody have a different opinion well and also but we, i know we're we've done a lot of training on trauma yeah, yeah. the trauma but we are yeah. kind of taking that on yeah. so as why would we so dr ruby have there been materials that are available to you that are in, you know and our teachers maybe that training for that yeah i know we've done a lot of trauma sensitive mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. but so if you go on to my website mm -hmm. on the um you'll see mm -hmm. under social emotional learning it talks about castle which is the the major organization in the in in the world for social emotional learning and they have lots of materials on trauma um, that are research-based evidence-based vetted and some of the training that we've done in district come at all is born out of the castle so I, I'm not really sure what they're talking about but I would just think that just like anything else there's controversy and they're not ready to step into that right now mm -hmm. because different people have different perspectives on that okay that's useful. I see. For me, I don't think that as a first order principle, you would let the uh, you would you would step away from trauma, right? right? Mm -hmm. First order principle, right? Yeah. You would want to make sure that we are standing up and saying we ought to do something on trauma based um, uh, situations for kids. So, uh, to me, I would vote against this one. Or maybe you could just find out more information too. About I, I can when you even at, I'm wondering yeah. at the conference yeah. do they offer they more will call a vote though at some, yeah, you know, yeah. at, at there you know so I won't be able to yeah. no but but you but you will know our our yeah. our, our tone mm -hmm. and you could uh, inform it based on the yeah. discussion yeah, yeah. right um, yeah I think we're just saying we'd like it a little stronger possible yeah. right mm -hmm. okay everyone okay with that general guidance to mm -hmm. our delegate Okay, okay. Um, 11.5, student achievement and assessment. Uh, the issue is the need to use student tests as teaching tools and not as part of the district's instructional program and to assure local school board involvement in assessment, accuracy, and relevancy of data used to assess the condition of education in the state of mm. Connecticut. Now, this one... Um, is, is a adjustment from a existing resolution. What they said in their explanation of changes, they consolidated items number one and two as both address student achievement. And they <coughs> consolidated three and eight as both addressed assessment data. I am not gonna read this, it's a, page, it's, a full yeah, page, a but to me, just quickly scanning it, it does look like the bolds are more about consolidation than they are about uh, changing the, the gist of it. Yeah. I think we could support this one. Agreed. Any, any differing opinion on that? No, no okay. I agree. So. Um, okay, 11.6, drug, tobacco, and alcohol use. Um, the issue is the need to eliminate use of illegal drugs and other substances, tobacco and alcohol, from our schools. The resolution 
Uh, well, first of all, the reason for the change was updated to reflect current legislation on recreational marijuana and cap, uh, cannabis. So, um, and uh, um, I'm just going to read the resolution. CABE supports mm -hmm. efforts of local, state, and federal level to eliminate and address the problems of inappropriate, unauthorized, illegal use of drugs, tobacco, and alcohol, and other substances in the school environment. Uh, CABE, and the highlighted words, CABE vigorously supports education about the recreational use of marijuana cannabis and its negative impact on children, their education and development. And the words vigorously supports education about the recreational use of marijuana cannabis and its, and its negative impact replaces opposed the le legalization of recreational use of marijuana right. because of its negative it's, impact on children. Right. Well, so that, that, that's, that, that, that ship has left, left the right. port, right. I fear. Well, so. so now we're going to be advocating for at least for education about yeah. it. Yeah. So that's, I think we can support that. Okay. Yeah, I think we have to deal with the situation. So that's 11.6. Um, uh, 11.7, technical education and career high school system. The issue, here's one that is the issue is the need for a strong state technical high school program. Um, and the reason for the change um, is just an editorial update to language. <laughs> um, and it changed, uh, they just added the word, it, it used to read CAVE supports a state technical high school system that, and it gives four things. And now it says CAVE supports a state technical educational and career high school system that. I think that's not a significant change. We could support that. 11.8, um, uh, family uh, health and uh, wellness education. So one of the changes is they changed the title of this one. Um, um, and in this one, the issue is the need for a program which deals with issues of family life education and human growth and development in the public schools. So the change here is the title is updated to reflect the current terminology. That's the only change. So I would, and it basically this resolution is urge each school district to, util, to utilize a developmentally appropriate curriculum which deals with issues affecting family life, child and human growth and development, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, LGBTQ, and uh, to involve the community in this process. So it's a broad-based, um, uh, uh, broad based, uh, we uh, looking for a program which deals with issues of family life, um, which so I think again, we do in our health curriculum. Yeah, this not? was already in place. They yeah. just changed the title to yeah. yes. health and wellness education versus instead of family, family life, life education. Right. Correct. And we have this sort of stuff in our health program, if I recall. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, Everyone okay with that one? Mm -hmm. Minor change. Uh, next one is 11.9, educator evaluation and support. Um, and the reason for the change here is resolution language was updated. Um, so here, um, the sub issue was education or evaluation and support guidelines and that CABE urges, and I paraphrase, um, that, they, uh, that the state P PEAC, which is the Professional Educational Advisory Council, continue to review the, the guidelines and that the uh, State Department of Education supports strong teacher induction into the per performance program to retain new teachers. So pretty straightforward things. We've been very active on how we've deal dealt with our evaluation program. So, and they mm -hmm. just changed the words to tie into the current language to include education or evaluation and support council, EES. So okay. nothing significant there. 11, is this working for everybody, by the way, mm -hmm. to plot yeah, through this? Good. Yeah. Digest each one. Okay. 11.10, performance accountability of contractors working in public construction projects. And the explanation here is clarified language. Um, and uh, that looks that, like they um, have just... Um, th what the resolution is, is CABE urges the General Assembly to hold contractors accountable for their performance on publicly funded projects by adopting the Department of Administrative Services recommendation that the maximum retainage on a project be increased from 2.5% to 
to the previous level of 10%. Mm -hmm. And all they did was they changed the language to the previous level of instead of a parenthetical as it used to be. That's the only change. I think we can support yeah, so that language yeah. <laughs> change. Um, what is, by the way, what is retainage? Just, it's not a big change here, but does anybody know what retainage is? Maybe Mr. Checo would know. Retainage is the amount you hold back on a contract for each application for payment as a so it's a hold back for it's performance. A, it's a hold back for performance. Okay, it's a hold back for performance. Good. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. For <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Engaging Mr. Checo. <laughs> <laughs> um uh light uh, item uh 11.11. .11. I presume those are 11 11s. or it was <laughs> ii.11. I'm not sure which, but uh this is public education funding um and it's just editorial changes. Um, the issue here on this one was that boards of education are increasingly challenged to obtain adequate funding through the normal sources of state and federal grants and local property taxes. I'm going to read this one because I think most of the public would be interested in it. It's not very long. The resolution as it re will read is CABE urges the General Assembly to ensure that the primary sources of local district funding are protected from erosion through the development of biennial state budgets which maintain grant funding at the existing levels and avoid imposition of mandates or state tax shifting which might result in the transfer of state obligations to local property taxes. Mm -hmm. CABE supports the concept of full state and federal funding on a current basis for any mandated programs. CABE supports the passage of legislation making state mandates on boards of educational uh, boards of education unenforceable unless fully funded. Um, the only change they made was it, where at the beginning it read CABE urges the General Assembly to ensure that it used to read CABE urges the General Assembly to take the necessary steps to ensure that. Right. So they eliminated the words to take the necessary steps, which made is it a little stronger. But just yeah. made it stronger, and I think we would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Everyone okay with that? Eleven dot twelve e learning and snow days. Um, this one is a new submission. Uh, the Portland Board of Education in in September of 2021 it sub submitted this. So I'm going to read it. The resolution, CABE urges the state and federal government to consider the effect of weather-related events that affect setting graduation date, the end of year activities, and the beginning of summer schools and camps. Recognizing that weather events, power outages, and other man-made disasters cause disruptions to continuous delivery of education in America's public school districts, Districts want the discretion to choose e-learning days for those school days affected by weather events and other disruptive events. The benefits of remote snow days would require districts to ensure all students, then there's three bullets, all students have an internet connected device with access to the internet, would require districts to provide professional development of tech skills related to e-learning, and year-round learning would be enabled through remote learning, including snow days. That seems like an awful big uh, unfunded mandate, if you ask me. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it kind of, I like the concept of it at the beginning, right? That, that you know, to, to take, in, take into account the, the snow days, but, you know, to require districts to have, the districts all of a sudden are responsible for everybody's interconnected connect, device and, mm. uh, year-round and, yeah. and year learning. Well, I think of the way they meant about the year-round learning isn't that we would all go year-round, but if there was year-round learning, you could do it through remote learning. So I, oh, go ahead. I, I read it as just that it gives, it would districts give districts the, the discretion right. to do that, not that they'd have to yeah. do that. Yeah, so but, but read the last graduation. sentence before the bullets. It would require require districts. Districts. The benefits sure. of, of remote snow days right. would require districts to ensure. Oh, see, I, I read it this. I read it like you, Debbie, too, where it was like we want the discretion, but you know, okay, if you're going to give us that discretion, we're promising to right. re to make sure that all the students have equitable access to devices and internet. Right and all of those other things. That's how I read it. The, I, I, my, but, my, yeah. my problem is I think it went too far. 
right? I, I think if they had stopped it at we want the discretion mm -hmm. and not have all the requirements, let us decide on how what we what each district would need to do. Yeah. Dr. Ruby, did you want to add something? Yeah, just, uh, just sure. yeah insure ensures what sure. set me off. In, in order for remote learning to work, we learned this. I mean, this is we already learned this lesson. Remote learning worked last year in the previous school year for the younger students because we made significant changes to how we brought children into school. We had kindergarten come um, half day for, I'm making this up, I can't remember, let's say six weeks, half day, so that the teachers could train the children with only having half of the students in the class, like six, seven, eight, nine, because some people didn't send their kids. So they could train them on how to use technology. And so we had much more success last year with remote, uh, with remote learning. This year, children who um, had to stay out of school for whatever reasons in the beginning of the year were totally and re continue to be totally lost because we didn't have we didn't teach those children how to use the devices and how to work with Google Classroom and Zoom and everything else that we did we spent a lot of time last year training teachers you guys helped us change the um, mm -hmm. the schedule and the PD days we did a lot of stuff so in order for I, I, I just want to voice my opinion as somebody who's working on curriculum and instruction to just be able to say we have remote snow days so that it makes it very convenient for all the end of the year events, we need to understand that that's just checking boxes for numbers of days and keeping our schedule okay at the end of the year. But it's at a tremendous cost of learning because we're not gonna take time out of our, even if we train children in the beginning of the year on how to use all these devices, if it's not ongoing and we get to December or January or whenever you have the snow day, Forget. forget it we just heard um, the mom talk about say, how the kids and then, we're, then we're taking away from the basics so I, I think that you know you have to decide what your priorities are are your priorities are the convenience of knowing when graduation is and planning those field trips and all, which are all important I'm not dismissing that but is that your priority or is making good use of the instructional time that we have um, the priority and you'll, parents, I mean, we heard from parents, thank you for the snow day. You know, kids need to be out. We, you know, most of us have children. Kids like snow days. Um, parents, maybe not so much. But you know, we're never going to please anybody. I just hope that we can stay focused on what our mission is, what we're here to do, and how important instructional time is. Okay. Maureen, I think Mary Rose was typing something in the chat on the screen to add to that. I don't know if Eric can pull up her, or you can. I, I couldn't read what she was trying to it. say. I, got I didn't know this. Um, Kay was in for half days through the beginning of November. Oh, excuse me, even more time. So thank you, Mary Rose. Yeah. So we really weeks. did a lot of work with those children. And you know, uh, the discussion that Joy brought up, it was, like ha you know, having only six to eight kids in the classroom for, for half a day, oh sorry, we got so much, we were able to teach so much more with the lower student to teacher ratio and that's why the children were prepared to do that work. So I just think, you know, there's no magic wand for, oh, we just give them a computer and they do remote, like it do doesn't happen like that. Okay. But I think we wouldn't want to bemoan another school district who wanted to do that option, right? Like, I think... Um, that's true. This is the advocacy you know, like, of discretion, and we don't have to. Yeah. That's not saying we have to do right. that. I mean, there might be other school districts, but that's just logistically... All it survive. does say school um, uh, districts want the discretion to choose e-learning days for those school days affected by the events. If they had stopped it there, right, and not put all the requirements, this could turn into the biggest mandate ever. Right. Right. I know, but I think we're hearing from the team that we probably wouldn't do remote snow days, right? Yeah, okay. the question is whether or not all districts would still have to ensure the, that these three bullets or only those who choose to use. I'm reading it only if you right. choose remote That's snow days. That's how I read it. That's how yeah. I read it as well. But what I can do is, during the discussion of this particular item, mm -hmm. clearly state that yeah. we don't like this part of it. But if you're just trying to get districts to have discretion in that matter, then 
we could call it. I would, I would actually yeah. I think you should go one step further, which is Disney. no, no. I think we're not gonna, we're not gonna fight against the districts having discretion. But what we've learned is, and then yeah. and then launch on the, mm -hmm. you know, kids' ability to deal with e-learning, and it worked when you had lots of easing in. I think that's a really good. I think the cave assembly ought to hear that. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and ultimately, this could really hurt districts that are more financially disadvantaged mm -hmm. than we are too, and they're the ones who might need it. You know, so those requirements could really hurt them, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, if it turned into a mandate that, that it it, would, you know, yeah. school districts all of a sudden are responsible for these bullet points down there, it would be, that's a big overreach yep. in my mind. So did you get enough for that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. 11.13, there's only a couple more, so uh, maybe there's more than a couple more. Uh, no, it's just a couple more. Three more. Um, Eleven dot thirteen is establish establishment of prioritized learner competencies standards for grades K to twelve. Um, the the this is a um, uh, submission from the Thomaston Board of Education, um, and it's the issue is the need for standardized prioritization of learning expectations and standards K twelve. The resolution. CABE urges that the state and federal governments to recognize the challenges facing America's public school districts and catching up for lost time and learning to COVID-19 closures. Establishing a narrowed set of common prioritized learning competencies and standards within each content area would allow districts and educators to effectively focus instruction and alleviate pressure on students to learn more than a year's worth of material in one year's time. Assuming no further disruptions beyond the 2019-20 school year. Furthermore, such prioritization would allow districts opportunities for meaningful collaboration uh, with a reduction in curricular variance between districts. Um, the statement of reason for the recommendation is addresses COVID and the learning loss of students due the timing with students returning to in-person learning it may not be needed. So. I'm not quite sure what that means. So I think. What do you think about that one, Martin? <laughs> so I think like, that my thought is like, don't, wouldn't we do this sort of at the local level? Do we need the state to sort of prioritize? For well, us? are there standards we have to comply with at the, the state? Well, level? we have the Common Core State standards, the NGSS standards, the we have standards for everything. But the state, this um, I was confused by the dates on this. Yeah. Because the state, if you were to go on the state website, the state has done a lot of work and they have done some prioritization of standards. Um, so I'm confused. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's why when this packet was sent out, they're saying we might not even need this and it might be redundant. Yeah. I'm, I'm confused by this because yeah. they've done a lot of work. We've gone to webinars. Yeah. We discussed it before um, earlier. That was the discussion that I had with the principals about do not launch into the curriculum. Correct. Correct when we have data that are showing us where, where the holes are. Mm -hmm. We need to work on that first. And you know, trying to really have teachers believe that we're not police. We're not trying, it's not a gotcha. We want them to support kids. And it ties into that whole social emotional piece. If we're putting all this pressure on kids to do things that they're not prepared to do, we're just gonna, we're gonna shut them down. Mm -hmm. And so we have to balance you know, and the data are so important um, for informing the instruction. If kids can't do X, and the curriculum for that for that grade level says you're supposed to be at double D or E or F, someplace down the, the, the field, you can't go there until you you teach them X. the precursor yeah. skills. Yeah. So question, so we don't need or want state and federal governments to tell us what to do on this because we got our hands on it or the state, I, us I, and the state the have state, our hands the on it? The state has provided us with a, a lot of a lot of resources um, that are on the website and we have that in in, in what we're doing. In Correct. what we're doing. Okay. I think that that is the the beauty of the assessments that we do use when they're when the data are used the way they're supposed to be used. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking Ooh, we're against this, this is not this. needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd just also like to add with regard to the way um, we uh, have our item banks in our standardized um, 
assessment and grading in the lower grades and we're working that up. We have items that, we're the, that the teachers use to assess mastery of standards. And we can tell because of the way they're designed when a child isn't meeting, a standard isn't like you almost met it or you met most of it, it's all or none. You either met the standard or you didn't meet the standard. And we're able to look at using our item banks and see what the precursor skills to that particular standard are that the student doesn't have so that we don't keep hitting them you know, with a hammer on what they didn't do. We go back and we teach what we know they need to know to be able to do what they couldn't do for their grade level standard. Okay. And our teachers have been like really working hard in K-4, which is where we completed the majority of that work um, for the past three years. And that we did that whole big thing before the pandemic on the standards-based grading. You might, I think, as a, as a parent, Rosa, you might have been part of that. And um, I can't remember who else's kids were in that area. But I think some of you are familiar with yep. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, went th I went through this, the thing with my grandchild. I saw oh, the thought. Exactly, yeah. so, so thank you. So, um, yes, so that one's a no. That one's kind of a no, it's not needed really. It's yeah. um, 11.14 um, out of 15. So, uh, the flexibility to employ individuals in career and trade fields as instructors. This is a new submission from the Waterbury Board of Education, uh, and the Government Relations Committee recommends adoption. And the issue is that boards of education are working to provide career preparation opportunities within the comprehensive high school system, but are finding it very difficult to employ individuals with both certification and trade experience. Our students will benefit greatly from learning from current practitioners of the trades. The opportunity to explore career pathways, combining education and training to prepare students for a full range of post-secondary education options, including apprenticeships fits Connecticut's educational goals. Resolution, CABE urges the State Department of Education and the General Assembly to take action to provide flexibility to comprehensive high schools to employ individuals in career and trade fields as instructors with professional certification in a specific trade similar to that that is provi provided to the Connecticut, Connecticut Technical and Educational Career System. So it, it, it's, it's basically saying you could do it with a professional instead of a teacher certified. Right. That's right. essentially what I do at West Coast. That's what you do at West Coast. Yeah, so colleges already do this. Yeah. We're, we're not considered a comprehensive high school. We're, comprehen yeah. we're, we're comprehensive. Not. We're not technical. And that's, oh, okay. that's the difference. So okay. what, what Waterbury is suggesting, which is in alignment with uh, some of the feedback on I Thought see. Exchange, yeah. okay. which is if we're going to expand options, right, in, okay. in, in career. You need to find instructors. You have to find instructors. It. And we know with the teacher shortage and, and the difficulty in finding, so this, would be this gives an opportunity. Thing. This would be a good thing. And it's not a requirement the way it's being proposed. Right, right. right. At least it's an option. That's we'd be, so we'd be supportive support of this one. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eleven dot fifteen. Anti hate speech. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, submitted by the CABE Board of Directors, um, and it's just a belief statement. CABE believes that all students deserve to learn in an environment that is safe, affirming, and free of bias and discrimination. CABE denounces the use of words or images that harass and directly attack individuals or groups based on race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender or gender expression, disability, or any other aspect or of identity. CABE believes that when students or adults speak explicit hate language at school, it is the responsibility of the school district to actively respond to these incidents. CABE urges boards to foster school climates where differences are appreciated and not used to ridicule, single out, intimidate, disrespect, or exclude different groups. We recognize that these injustices can have a negative impact on the educational experience that we expect for each child. So it's about adopting that belief statement. I'd like to see like political affiliation in there. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good, good catch. Because we have seen situations in the schools where mm -hmm. political affiliation becomes a problem. Okay. Noted. Okay. Any other suggestions on that one? Okay. 
Is this helping you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. Can I talk about the deletions? Now? Yeah, I'm going to do the deletions next. Okay. So, um, deletion. There are three deletions proposed. The first one is vaccination of public school students. Um, and uh, the resolution was about urging the General Assembly to remove the religious exemptions from vaccinations to measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, and um, it, with the, uh, it, yeah, the explanation of changes, it's already well, been done, it's already law. Right. Yeah, that's not my All right. Okay. Everyone's fine with that deletion, mm -hmm. I yep. presume? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't really debate the deletion. No, we? no, well, no, you no, can't. We can, but. We can, it's, it's but more like Okay, local pol uh, local program policy decisions is I I I dot two, um, and the deletion. The reason it's proposed for deletion is the issue was covered in the legislative school board partnership resolution, which is one dot thirteen in the consent agenda, um, and uh, and it was a, a uh, the issue was local and regional boards of education are best able to make take local considerations into account in their decision making. <laughs> I hope so. Um, resolution, the CAVE supports the local development of specific subject area requirements to, to uh, course content requirements and staff and resource requirements that uh, grow out of local goals and specific goal uh, learning objectives, result from local policy decisions regarding program staffing and resources, and result in local policy decisions regardless regarding effective and efficient practices. So it was about us having the ability to make the decisions we need to make. So as you've read the, um, uh, Rosa, the, that this item 1.13 in the consent agenda, does it in fact cover that? So that resolution, which is, it's a little long, but it reads, CABE urges school boards to provide legislature, legislators with, objectively an, uh, with objective analysis of proposed legislation. CABE urges the General Assembly to exercise restraint when addressing educational issues that impact local operations. Overly prescriptive law or regulation inhibits local capacity to innovate and best serve its public. CABE supports a requirement that a local impact study be conducted before any education laws or policies are enacted by the General Assembly or regulations that are, or regulations are adopted by the State Department of Education. The local impact study shall include costs and benefits of such law policy regulation. So it's broadly written. Yeah, so I mean, I get so it's uh, it's deleted. I, I understand the, that, but I, I just have to say it publicly. That's I think that's terrible. Taking power away from local boards of ed to make decisions and, and policies. I mean, that's what we were doing in policy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't like. I guess it's already deleted, so it is what it is. But I think well, I can vote against the deletion. But I think what they're saying is, is that we don't. They don't. They're not deleting because they disagree with it. They're deleting it because they feel that it's. These are the things that they are. That they are also lobbying for, and they feel that it's, it's redundant. Covered, that that it's redundant. Removed, the language of local regional boards of education are best able to make local considerations into account in their decision making. Well, why isn't that? Why can't that just be? Staying well, do you feel that it's not covered by? I don't this think resolution? what you read is covered at all. I don't. Okay. I think it was that was more direction to the state that they can't implement mandates without doing local impact assessments. Okay. Right? I I didn't hear that strong a statement that's in that's in what is written here. Okay. Which item was that number? Uh, all, all three of those? 3.2. 3 .2, the oh, middle no, one. Just the, uh, just the issue the line that I, I was reading. On. Okay. Yeah. But I also feel like, you know, we don't have the same challenges as Danbury. We don't have the same challenges as Bethel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had, there was a statement in there. Uh, that's a long sentence. The need for a legislator. No, I meant this one. Oh, uh, yeah. Best interest of all Connecticut children. Well, we live in a suburb we don't live in a city yeah so no yeah this is this yeah so this is what they're saying the issue is the resolution is this is this is the the wording that they are going to oh, okay be okay pushing. yeah, yeah, so, yeah I, didn't yep. like that, so yeah i just don't think it's strong enough in what they're saying it's covered by okay i guess does I, everyone else I agree vote with against that, that deletion mm -hmm. okay 
and uh, item 3.3, .3, which is the last item that we need to talk through, I think, right? Is that the last one? Mm -hmm. um, they're deleting uh, it's something because it's no longer a statewide issue, and the subject was regional so, educational service center duties uh, directed by the state. So, and an issue with is some legislative initiatives have utilized RESCs, which is the regional educational service centers, to execute and evaluate statewide programs without adequate funding. The resolution was that CAVE urges the General Assembly to continue to utilize RESCs for statewide programs to fund them adequately and refrain from mandating additional duties for RESCs which would compromise their gov governance structure funding process or compete with time and resources needed for programs expe expected by local districts. Do we use anything from RESCs? Well, we work with Ed Advance. Ed Advance that, that is has, an RESC? To, yes, but that oh, okay. has to do with them specifically in their funding model. It has nothing yes, to do with us as really a district. That doesn't impact us. And it just, it's, it's an no longer, on them. It's no longer an issue. It mm -hmm. says it's no longer a statewide issue, so. I'm kind of indifferent so on that. So we're voting against that? No, I vote for it. Oh, for, for the deletion. Yeah, I think we leave it. Yeah. It really yeah. doesn't apply, so we can agree with it. All right, so it took a little bit of time, but yeah. was that, no, that was useful doing. That was good. So, yeah, yeah, we learned stuff. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so um, so with that, I would uh, make a motion that uh, we authorize our chairman to vote um, on these uh, these items as guided by input that we've provided tonight. Yeah. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Um, item E in our agenda is the Brookfield Administrators Association contract. Okay. I will move that the board approve the successor contract between the Brookfield Board of Education and the Brookfield Administrators Association. I'll second. Okay. Um, is there any discussion on this? Or who was our who was our negotiating committee? We have Amy, Mike, and Debbie. Are you guys happy with what we negotiated? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? I think that if uh, we ought to probably just do a high-level summary because the public does listen to this. What what were the key changes in the uh, uh, in the uh, agreement? Was there anything substantive other other than normal salary increases and benefit changes? The athletic director is now a 12-month position. Oh. And that was it. I think that's the only thing I remember in the note that we received. Um, and the salary increases were within the bounds of what we have been generally budgeting, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Any other discussion on that? Or is that the, that was the secretary's? Yeah. Okay. I'm confused. Sorry. All right. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. So that's unanimous. The on to old business, we have the Candlewood Lake Elementary School presentation uh, by Dr. John Burrell. All right, everybody. Thank you. Um, the PowerPoint queued up, and we also invited Mr. Checo from the Municipal Building Committee to be with here, be with here, be here with us, excuse me, <laughs> uh, this evening. The late hour might have gotten me there for a second. My apologies. Um, so we're going to go through this presentation. Um, just very briefly as an overview, the presentation was uh, developed at the request of the board members to provide an overview of kind of what the, the, the moving and transition plan will look like for Candlewood Lake Elementary for our staff and our students, effect on our families, as well as preparing for uh, the budget uh, for uh, the coming year, 22-23. And that budget presentation, as we've alluded to a few times, will be at our next board meeting on December 1st. Um, a major impact on that budget would be any um, reallocations, any new hires, uh, positions we need, et cetera, to really run uh, the building at an optimal level. Uh, having said that, um, we're going to right off the, the bat talk about the construction schedule. And importantly, I mentioned that because that's going to impact our, our ability to start the 22-23 year in Candlewood Lake Elementary, which as we back that up, there's less of a budgetary impact on the 22-23 uh, year 
and it moves forward into the 23-24 year. Regardless, I want to acknowledge the uh, construction uh, piece, also acknowledge and walk through the structure and vision for the school and that transition plan, and then invite Mr. Checo to engage with us on any questions about the actual construction project and the timeline and so forth. All right, so as we know, we have the rendering of the new school. Um, that is kind of from the right side of the building where there'd be entry to the cafeteria, and then you can see the roofing area to the entry of the building uh, to the uh, main entrance. I'm going to go to the next slide, which is actually about a 90-second drone video of the current construction just taken last week. And Eric, you said this would just play automatically, and there it goes. So we'll just be quiet and take a look at things. You mean the pilot's not now? The pilot is no, not. not. <laughs> and as you can see there, the, the, as it's moving around to the left, that those are the neighborhoods you're seeing there uh, constructed. And that's that side of the building that's closest uh, at the bottom of the screen is the kindergarten side of the building. You can see to the right, the pre-K structure is not developed yet. You see a foundation there for that. And now we're, the drone is on the Danbury side of the Huckleberry property or Candlewood Lake property. And in the distance, you could see the, foot, the, the existing Huckleberry Hill School in the parking lot. As the video goes around, you can see that would be... Um, I know you don't get an appreciation for the size of it until you, when you see like the, you know, Huckleberry next to this building and then realize also that this building is twice the height of it as well. Yeah. And then you're like, wow. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's it a it's a beauty. Like that one uh, that the the wing closest to us is much more finished than the other two. That's the yeah, cafeteria they're, area. They're, yeah, they're working that way. Cause yeah, the pre-K walls haven't even gone up. That's cool. It looks pretty with the fall colors and the trees behind it. Hmm. It was the architect in the room. They purposely set that up. <laughs> <laughs> So there we also go. Get a feeling of like the size of it when you see like. You're All like, right. Oh, it's a tiny little thing. I can just go, like, Eric. That's a giant excavation <laughs> machine. <laughs> All right, I got it. I got it. All right, so yeah. I really want to address something very important for everyone. Um, it's critical that people understand before I get into the what the transition uh, is planned to look like. And again, it's the transition really is not going to happen next year as quickly next year as we thought. There's there's a, a several month delay on things. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, so we do have some supply chain issues. Uh, specifically, roofing materials are delayed by about three to four months. Uh, this past Friday, uh, Mr. Checo from the Municipal Building Committee had information from ONG, the construction company, on an updated calendar. We've been talking about that at several board meetings for the last month to get this accurate updated calendar. And thankfully, they, they got that to us at this point so it could uh, help us in terms of the impact on uh, budget and the like. Um, so the materials are delayed, um, and uh, the elementary, the new elementary school will not be ready to begin the 22-23 school year. So the impact that everybody needs to understand is we will have a essentially, for the most part, a status quo year, a status quo start to the year, uh, very traditional for how we move forward with our grades. And it'll look uh, very sim simply like this. Our current grade four students will transition and attend Wiskineer for grade five next year. They will not be able to go to Candlewood Lake Elementary School. There will there just won't be space because of the timing of the delay, which will take us halfway through the year. By that time, they'll have experienced half of fifth grade. There'll be Wildcats at Wiskineer, and it, it's just not feasible. Um, sent, uh, CES, grades pre-K to one, will remain at CES for the entire year next year. Huckleberry, Grades two through four, the current model, will begin the year at Huckleberry, and it is anticipated the school will be finished uh, sometime in December, and we would plan for a very organized and intentional move-in after the holidays. Part of that will be looking at the school calendar next year, and I'll bring a proposal uh, likely at the December 15th meeting to, uh, to help everybody over time understand the impact of this so everybody could absorb it. Uh, so I just said that in, that's in white there in January, Huckleberry would move in. Then, what, this is something that conceptually a lot of people didn't understand with, with the construction project. Demolition of, of Huckleberry, the, the building, once it's emptied, uh, will begin sometime in January or February of 2023. So that's about 13, 14 months away. 
um, not this summer as we initially thought because of the delay. We need a place for the students to go to school. Um, at that point, once Huckleberry is demolished, we have to build the other side of the parking lot and the driveways for buses and everything else. And so there's only so much access to the building. And so we wouldn't have been able to move in all students, all 1,100 students at one time regardless. So there was going to have to be a phased in plan anyway. And then um, the, the moving phase will be completed during the summer of 23, and that's when the center school students would prepare and the teachers would move in, and then we would have a full complement to start the fall of 23, 23, 24 year, everybody being in the building. And so that's how that, and then we would be one school um, ready to go. So that is the updated schedule. It's important for the board and the public to know that that was announced to our pre-K-5 teachers yesterday at the beginning of their uh, professional learning. So just a sequence of events, Municipal Building Committee informed uh, Mr. Dunn and myself on Friday. I forwarded that information to the board immediately um, and then updated the board with this information over the weekend and uh, into Monday. Uh, we talked with our pre-K to five staff, uh, faculty I should say, not all staff, faculty yesterday morning. Uh, to be very frank, as I was saying in my superintendent report, extremely positive in terms of one, um, a well-adjusted staff understanding worldwide supply chain issue. In addition to that, there was some angst with people in terms of feeling like they were moving in fast, and this gives them some more time to move in a little more methodically, a little more intentionally, and they could be thinking this through. And that opportunity uh, for collaboration and team building over the course of the next year and a half, they were actually really excited about. And of course, some people were really excited to move, and there's obviously some disappointment there. Um, as Mr. Checo always says, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to look back, and th what really matters is we build the school properly and of high quality for the citizens of this town and, for, of course, for our students. All right. So I have a history here. I'm not going to run through word for word. It's important for the slideshow when I put these together that it shows, shows a story and tells a story for, for the reader. So um, as I present this, I'll, uh, considering the hour and the length of the meeting tonight, I'll just hit some, some highlights for everybody on this slide. But it's important for those who aren't familiar with the project or new to the community to understand there's six years of history to getting to this. Besides the decades of talking about it, we really got to work back in 2015 and starting to address how we might approach this. Um, we hired, ultimately decided to have a building condition study to really analyze the, the value and the, the, the lifespan of our existing facilities and where were we putting our money? Where was it best invested? Ultimately, the decision was made after focus groups and all kinds of community engagement to move forward with a, a new school. We explored lots of options prior to that. The new school was the decision to be made. There was land utilization and all kinds of studies involved. Um, and that really, it, you know, we kind of did it in two year segments. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, the continued design collaboration has been ongoing. A lot of work with the educators on the educational specifications. That's really the program. And then obviously our our professionals really uh, teched on and our municipal building committee working on the actual design of the facility. Um, we bid the project, um, start times were involved, school naming committee was involved, and as you all remember, we were all there, we broke ground last, um, officially uh, we started, uh, we had a ceremony I think in March and then we, we really were breaking ground in, in May. So a lot of great history there with this project. So the overarching plan for those who are not familiar with it, at the end of the day, we are consolidating the current, the, the grade five model that is in the uh, portables at Wiskineer with our center school students and with our Huckleberry students. So comprehensively pre-K through five, we are joining three different uh, faculty and staffs together. And the original plan um, are, and I mentioned this earlier, are rising fifth graders. So students currently in fourth grade would have the opportunity um, to be in Candlewood Lake Elementary, and because of the delay, that, that is not going to work, work out. So we had goals and, and opportunities in this transition plan, so this is important. I do want to walk through these, all five of these. Um, the first thing, when we, one of the big decisions going into building the new school versus like a renovated new or something like that was minimal disruption to staff and students. We really didn't want to impact teaching and learning. Um, and we achieved that where the kids are in their spaces, essentially not disrupted the entire construction process time. We want to make sure that we're building relationships among faculty as they join together. 
We want to use the design of the building strategically to create opportunities for establishing and sustaining a very, a very, this was really important, a family-oriented culture, supportive of student academics, and connection. And obviously, um, continued consultation with the folks from uh, Yale. As a matter of fact, Dr. Cipriano uh, gave the keynote yesterday with our pre-K-5 staff. Uh, Dr. Cipriano works in the Yale uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale. Uh, develop protocols to operate Candlewood Lake efficiently uh, and safely and ensure all the personnel transitions align with all contractual obligations. So the process overview, I'm going to go through uh, briefly, uh, go through several slides, uh, talk about user group input, organizational structure, the upper and the lower houses, um, and the rationale for that organizational structure, the, some of the PD that's uh, commensurate with our uh, transition, uh, how staffing will work. So while it was the staffing was a big preparation for the December 1st mm -hmm. budget, we were ready. Th those changes will not occur to the following year. Um, obviously, school operations is going to be big. How, how do we have uh, the schools function in a house system, but also together as one, and where is that appropriate? And as we've talked about, Principal Labrashano and Principal Diamond in collaboration, working together with their staffs and making that all work. Um, and then the supply chain delay in the roofing materials, just as a, a review of that other slide from before. So in the user groups, uh, it's important to know right now, we're preparing for bid on furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, something called small wares. Uh, we think all the way down to waste baskets and flags and all those little details. Um, and technology, which includes up upgrading the phone system and simultaneously upgrading the phone system for the other schools as well. It's not part of the project monies, it'll be part of other funding that we've been working through and Eric's working on that. So a lot of that's been going on, a lot of collaboration there. And then as you can see, there's a very lengthy list over the past uh, several years where Specialist spaces, you know, uh, art, music, phys ed, the collaboration and the work that went into that with Tecton and having the staff there who are going to be in those spaces help with the physical design to make the educational specifications of program come to life. Uh, library media center work, uh, resource rooms, uh, speech and language, tutoring spaces, uh, the teacher work in breakout room, uh, break rooms, uh, the gymnasium, all the technology, administrative offices, nurses' offices, um, the storage, custodial and maintenance needs, um, the cafeteria and the kitchen, um, and certainly security and shelter and voting and all of those things. So all of that has been discussed over the last three years with Tecton, and that's called the user groups. Uh, so the organizational structure, we've talked about this several times, um, upper and lower house. Um, and what we're going to do there is the structure would be one principal and one assistant principal in each upper and lower house, okay? And um, you could see in the, I'm losing my sight there, I want to make sure I get it there. Um, for We have pre-K in the lower house, and that's so that's pre-K to two. And then in the upper house, grades three to five, one principal and one assistant principal. And then we have our grade five academy. Uh, we worked with Mrs. Labrashano, and she's starting to work with Mr. Renda, what that schedule can look like, and some of the really interesting things we're going to do. And again, this is going to evolve over time, and it's going to happen at an even more intentional and even slower rollout than initially planned. Um, both the upper and lower house, uh, don't forget, uh, in our spotlight tonight, Mrs. Baldwin had joined us. She's our special education supervisor, pre-K to five. She is a across three schools right now the way we are she will be housed at one school okay so she'll be there um, so we have a lot of things to consider uh, the one start time um, we also have to look at the I've got to turn this just a little bit excuse me thank you I'm sorry what's that oh better for you too oh good um, there we're, we're moving to, we talked about the start times, right? So a two-tier bus system is what we envision. Um, and so what that would be is one tier for the elementary and then one tier for middle and high school. But all parents with middle schoolers, there would be separate bus runs for middle and high school. We wouldn't be mixing them. So that was something. Thank you, Jen. Remember we worked on that? Yeah. All right. Um, the main entrance and the process for visitors is something we, we're looking at where we're uniting, that we'd be uniting the uh, upper and lower house. Uh, the separate neighborhood wings um, for each grade level and support services. So in each grade level wing or neighborhood as we're calling it, there are all the support services are built in. So we're, we're trying to reduce travel time as well. So it really will make things feel small and intimate and back to that family um, uh, climate that I was talking about before. Um, and then the upper and lower also have separate spaces. So if you're in the upper, you have your separate art, and special areas and the same thing with downstairs and, uh, and, and health suites, et cetera. 
And then the leadership structure that we envision, the, the adjustment would be uh, one principal, remember, Wiscaneer is going to lose a whole grade. That's 200 kids, essentially. You figure about 800 kids at the middle school. The, um, it would be one principal and one assistant principal. Right now, there's one principal and two assistant principals. So there'd be a reallocation of one of the assistant principal FTEs from Wiscaneer to Candlewood Lake Elementary. Remember, Candlewood Lake Elementary is going to be much bigger than uh, Wiscaneer and bigger than the high school. So we have to have the proper supervision. Um, and then we are envisioning, um, uh, specifically due to the uh, needs of middle school students and uh, pre-adolescents, uh, a dean of students position. And so we're gonna talk about how we can work on that with Mr. Renda over time. And we envision um, a reallocation of uh, positions with some of the things we're going to do to match the needs and the change in the district. Um, but uh, considering uh, when you talk about positions, you affect people's lives, and we're not looking to do that at this point. There's no need to discuss where that might happen because what we're thinking right now may change over the next year. So I'm confused. That that's, says you have three administrators still at Wiscaneer. Um, the dean of students is that we are envisioning that as a teacher leader position. It wouldn't be an administrator position. So it's a I'm, non-active teaching position, so you haven't really reduced in but that's why I'm talking about there will be a reallocation, but I'm not announcing what that reallocation would be. So it wouldn't it wouldn't be an ad. It would be a reallocation of existing staff. And again, this is early in the sharing process. So the rationale for the organization is we really need to make sure that the develop, ne developmental needs of our youngest learners are met, and we want to make sure that we have that personal connection and providing those conditions in that close-knit family uh, environment. Uh, supervisor, supervisory ratio uh, provides uh, administrator to two student supervision. We typically have one administrator to, and it depends on the school, between 200 and 300 students. And so um, this model that I just went through will, will continue and maintain that ratio. Uh, the administrator to teacher supervision, um, it's typically when you average it out, and again, there's pockets where it's quite a bit more and, and some where it's less, but among our administrations, uh, they typically evaluate and supervise between 15 and 20 uh, faculty members and that maintains the current ratio. Uh, and of course, family engagement, we wanna make sure that we're able to respond and engage with families. And so it's important that we have the proper supervision in place, proper administrative uh, uh, authority, frankly, in the buildings. Um, we also wanna ensure that each house and neighborhood is structured to provide academic rigor. Um, I think that's something we heard tonight along with student wellness, um, opportunities to build independence, of course, to be safe and secure, flexibility for staffing um, in service to student scheduling needs. So for example, and um, when you don't have to travel between schools and somebody's assigned a majority of their schedule perhaps to the upper house, it's it's much simpler process to move downstairs for a, a class or two that you might have to cover or a student uh, hours of need, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, making sure that the grade five students uh, transition to the middle school um, uh, in a more, in that traditional model uh, for uh, middle school, which is the sixth through eighth grade, because they would stay with Candlewood Lake through fifth grade. The other thing we wanna talk about is professional learning and the team building and bringing those three schools together. I already talked about uh, what we did yesterday with the uh, pre-K to five faculty and, and in a real kickoff and in initiating things. We're gonna continue that throughout next year. Um, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity. Uh, one of the things that Maureen and I shared in the budget priorities last uh, last meeting was talking about really starting to examine our uh, specifically our ELA and our math curricular tools. When you bring fifth grade into the fold now, actually working with their colleagues uh, in the lower grades, that's natural team building. They're working on, on, on authentic projects, frankly, together. So that's important. Um, and there's also uh, some tentatively planned social studies work for the grade five teachers. One of the things we're talking about is that in the academy, the grade five teachers and the, the students would change classes uh, by subject where, uh, and, and all the teachers would teach uh, social studies and then they'd have their specific speciality. So there's some PD that needs to be done there to support our staff so they're ready for that. 
The staffing transitions, we're talking about uh, about 180 employees that would be at the school. So moving them from three different buildings, we have to make sure there's a lot of work that has to go. Uh, again, that was for next year we were thinking about that, but now it's not gonna be until 23, 24. The real rule of thumb here is that if you're a second grade teacher at Huckleberry right now, when it's time to go to Candlewood Lake, you're most likely gonna be a second grade teacher, you know, unless there's enrollment shifts or something like that at Candlewood Lake. Or if you're a kindergarten teacher or pre-K teacher at Center or a fifth grade teacher at Wiskineer, you're just gonna teach somewhere else. And essentially, most people stay in the same su uh, grade level or, uh, and or special subject uh, throughout their career. Um, but again, requests, enrollment, retirement, all those things get affected. Um, so again, just going to the no new net administrator FTEs and reminding everybody that two principals, one in uh, upper and lower, two assistant principals, upper and lower, and then the special education supervisor. So for approximately 1,100 students, we would have uh, five administrators physically in the building. Um, and again, I talked about the original plan, and uh, now we're gonna have to wait till 23, 24. Some other things that are very interesting at the bottom of that in the italics, um, it's important just to know that it's not just regular ed classroom teachers. Um, we've got paraeducators, we've got special education staff, um, we have all the special subjects to think about transfer, the nurses, the custodians, the secretaries, the technology team. I mean, there's a lot of different support folks that are critical to moving our schools forward that support our schools and we have to have them there. Then I talked about the reallocation piece of the Dean of Students at the middle school, um, and that would be something new, although a reallocation. And then in addition to that, um, working with Chief Purcell, they're recommending the Newtown model, which would be um, a school security officer. That would be a retired police officer. Um, at least when I was working with Mr. Dunn, the thought was that it would that would be through the police department budget, and then we'd have that um, person as a uh, trained with us and, and working with us, but trained by the police department specifically, and then working there. That also that position acts as a greeter, so that'd be something we can have someone there at the door, uh, greeting individuals as they come in and being security and being a, frankly an armed presence that could keep things secure. With that many kids in one one space, we really thought that that's what we need to do. School operations, so the original plan, I've, I've kind of gone through this of how we were gonna move in and so forth, so I'm not gonna belabor that. Um, but what's important to know, in, I told this, I've told this to different faculty members, teachers are gonna be responsible for, for some packing, and we'll outline what that is, but there's an actual bid in the project budget for moving. So no one's gonna be expected to pack these boxes and bring, put them in the trunk of their car and move them over to their classroom. One most of the material the the furniture is or is going to be brand new and in the classroom um, so that's going to be all set up for the teachers um, uh, things that we keep such as our tech some chromebooks and things like that will be, be moved over there but teachers will be work will work specifically on um, curricular tools how we want to pack those up label those and movers will be moving those so that'll be a very organized process that we go through and then of course we've got the new start times to be thinking about in the two-tiered bus system. So if everybody can recall, just a reminder, uh, we were gonna move to 8 a.m. for the high school and uh, the middle school, and then move a little bit later to make the bus busing work, 8.50 for the elementary school, and that would end at 3.35. Um, and in this PowerPoint, so for the public that's watching, they could click on the Healthy School Start Times presentation that we did about a year and a half ago. And then, of course, logistical planning has been underway. How are we going to do arrival and dismissal and all of those things? And that's been a big, uh, big source of, of focus for the, um, the principals and administrative team, thinking through all that, all those uh, efficient safety procedures. Just as uh, I, I included here a uh, drawing, uh, a schematic, excuse me, of the outline of the building, which you can see on the left that we just saw. The first part of the parking lot that's nice and clean where we could fit about half of the cars and that's why we would have had to have had a phased in move and you could see where it says construction area in red that's the existing footprint of of the uh, huckleberry and when we knock that down we would then have to build a whole new parking lot that would work with uh, with the other part of the parking lot and again that takes time and so ultimately this rendering shows what the parking will look like as you can see, very nice flow in and out. And then uh, again, I have this here. I don't need to go through this with everybody, but just a reminder of, uh, it was part of the initial slide about the supply chain delay. And I think it's gonna be important for Mr. Checo to join us in just a second here. I did put at the bottom though, that I recommend, the board had voted that next year, 
we start with the change in school start times, considering the supply chain delay and everything going on, I and and entering into a bus bid right now and likely a new five-year bus contract, I recommend that we postpone and delay that change in start times one year and and keep it um, the same for next year. Okay, that's a that's that's a separate recommendation that the board will need to take action on. And then finally, next steps, just so everybody knows the things we're thinking about. Obviously, staffing's a big piece I talked about. What we would have been preparing and proposing on December 1st for the budget for next year, that is postponed, and that won't be until at this time next year for the, for the budget. Um, we have to look at security, technology, the grade five model, all the logistical um, and uh, visitor protocols and the like, um, all the features. Um, and uh, the things we, we need to do. We're going to talk about that in various forums, drop in Zoom meetings, all kinds of exciting opportunities where people could just check in and we could do little mini presentations or we could just have conversations like this and answer lots of questions. Um, in addition to that, uh, protocols with building administration, I talked about that. Uh, spending plan, um, Ken's working with Technon on the energy savings and how that'll be impacted in the budget. That's very important. Um, people forget Huckleberry is heated by electricity, so it's quite expensive. Um, and we're going to have natural gas at the new school, which is a lot less expensive. Um, all the moving and the bids that I talked about, uh, planning for the teacher assignments, staff assignments, and the transition and transfers, um, accounting protocols. We're going to be going, we're, we're downsizing Wiskineer, and we're taking two schools offline and creating one new school. So there's accounting procedures and protocols that have to be worked on, and Ken's preparing that. Um, and then finally, I talked a little bit about on December 15th, I'll bring a district calendar forward because one of those has to incorporate when teachers move in mid-year next year, when our Huckleberry teachers move to Candlewood Lake, they're going to need some time to set up the classrooms. So we've got to look at uh, our actual school days for the students and how we might make that work within our existing budget. That's a lot of information coming at everybody, but I wanted to get through that as quickly as I could. And Mr. Checo is here as well. If you, Paul, I think you might be able to join us actually at the table. It might be easier for you. And um, conversation time. Thank you very much. So I, I feel like I was trying to digest all that. That's really a lot, quickly. Debbie. It's a lot. <laughs> Can you just sort of summarize? Because I'm not, I think what I heard you say is, we're still not moving, even though there's delays in roofing materials, we're still not moving all grades in at the same time. Correct. Okay. So can you just tell, say again what that staggered move-in time? Great be? question, and I'll work right through that. And, and by the way, I, I failed to share. I sent out an email that lays this all out for all staff today, right before uh, this afternoon. And tomorrow, the PowerPoint and that a similar... Uh, letter will go to all families so everybody knows what's going on and it lays it out exactly as you're asking so to start next year it's a traditional start to the year um, the building will not be ready the hope is late november december it, we probably could get a uh, certificate of occupancy and really be moving in at that point which would lead to an intentional well let me let me stop for a second so when i say traditional start Center school goes to center school and is just going to stay at center school for the year, okay? Wiskineer, the grade five students, so current grade four, matriculate to grade five, stay at Wiskineer. Huckleberry starts at Huckleberry, grades two, three, and four. And let's say if everything goes well, right after the holidays next year, January of 23, the kids, the buses bring them to Candlewood Lake instead of Huckleberry and they go into their new classrooms, okay? And that's where you think, you think about time, where our teachers, even though things will be moved there for them, they need to be, a, in a mid-year, have to have time to set up their classrooms. And the hope is that over the fall, the building is in a, a, a quality situation where, on their own time, hey, the, the, your wing will be open. Feel free to go in and get excited and work on your classroom um, on other time as well. And what will then happen, Deb, and this is where people didn't understand, Huckleberry is still standing. It needs to be demolished. That takes a few months, as I understand it, and Paul could give the details on that. But longer than just eight weeks to knock a building down, we then it has to be removed safely and properly. The area where the school had been needs to be constructed into the proper parking lot. That takes another 
chunk of time. That takes us through the spring of 23. Okay. So even if we wanted to force the center school kids in at mid-year as well, there's no physical place for parking for staff, busing. It just couldn't work. There's just not enough yeah. physical space. And so fall of 23, we have the summer to get everything ready with the parking lot and everything all set, right, Paul? Yeah. The kids will rise and move forward. The, the fourth graders next year who had moved in mid-year to Huckleberry will become fifth graders at Candlewood Lake, and new kindergartners will come in, and everyone will matriculate over to Candlewood Lake. So the okay. start 23, with everything we know right now, we would be able to move into the school with all students and staff. And those fifth graders will just move to sixth grade, and they will have a continuous experience at Wisconsin. Cor correct. There will be a continuous experience at Wisconsin. Which is why you leave them one of the things we talked about that with the pre-k-5 folks yesterday and, and i indicated in my communication uh, to the staff today is so this also gives us more time to celebrate the history of both schools alumni staff alumni students um, i know the ptos want to do some work with that so that's actually really exciting as well so um, i hope that breaks it down yep. okay thank you do you mind if i ask some questions to sure bob please and so first of all paul thank you for coming I just appreciate that. It's great to have you here again. Um, so, and, and if I thank, wanted to be here, no. And thank you for sitting through our long discussion on Cape uh, <laughs> on Cape uh, resolution. Not a problem. Um, so supply chain. Uh, yeah. Let's start with supply chain. And uh, could you talk uh, just a little bit more about what we're learning about with the roofing materials, and sure. then and then secondarily. Are there other supply chain issues that are risks to us? Okay. So. You don't mind. Yeah. Okay. When we talk about supply chain, um, you know, everybody's thinking about ports and uh, you know the port of Los Angeles and 60 ships out at sea, and we're not talking about that type of supply chain here with building material, particularly with roofing. What we're talking about is the Texas freeze last year. Now, the state of Texas um, is a hub for manufacturing for chemical processes. So when you think about um, adhesives for roofing material, you think about TPO, uh, thermoplastic membrane. We talk about expanded polystyrene for roofs, which is styrofoam. Those are all chemicals. That, during the Texas freeze last year, a lot of manufacturing got shut down. Now, we had a very, very high demand at the same time for construction material. Then Texas kind of shut down for the freeze, and we have low supply. That's what's creating this backlog. It's taken some time to get those plants back online. Um, the trucking industry, obviously, in COVID didn't help much, but we've had a, such a big response in the construction industry over the last 24 months that both COVID and the Texas freeze just backed everything up. The problem with the roofing, and you know, we all think about the roofing uh, on our houses and it's just shingle, you know, it's, it's a composite system that we put on these buildings. So it consists of a base sheet, insulation, a cover board, a membrane, various adhesives and mechanical fasteners. These all come from a singular manufacturer. And they have to come from a singular manufacturer so we get a warranty on the system. And that system is from the top of the roof deck to the top of the roof, and it's that whole sandwich. If we mix and match, we're gonna be left with a $1.2 million roof without a 20-year warranty that we purchased. So that wouldn't be good fiscally. The, so that, that's the supply chain in a nutshell. Um, we've been moving with concrete. You're seeing that steel is going up. We actually have interior walls going in. Electrical can't be run yet until we get the roofing on. We do have enough roofing right now for areas A and B, those two on the right, um, which you saw kind of partially done right now. So the interior work will continue there. We are looking into alternative manufacturers and have been actually since July to see if there's any improvement we can make. But right now, all indications are the balance of the roofing is going to come in February unless we can find an alternative manufacturer um, for the systems. Okay. So that's the supply and, chain. And are we pretty confident about February or is it, uh, we do, we is it just still an open-ended, I think I can get it there? Look, it's always... Um, we did receive a letter directly from Johns Mansville, who is the roofing manufacturer, that February was the likely target date. They've delivered part of the material to the site, and that's when they're committing to supplying the rest. Now, that being said, I mean, 
if you can predict the market as well as I can, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here. Um, are there always those outliers? Yes. Are there any indications in the construction market and the construction indices now that we're going to see any other kind of ripple or residual effects? Not at this time. And, you know, we trend that on a weekly basis. And we knew about the roofing, like I said, it started in July. We just didn't know what the total implication was going to be until last week until we got a firm commitment. Now, are there other areas that you're worried about for supply chain types of delays? I mean, that to, that are on your radar screen? Not at this time. We haven't been apprised of any from the construction manager. Um, the roofing was a big one, and again, because we talk about construct um, consecutive processes, right? We need a roof on the building in order to do the electrical, in order to do the mechanical. That's why that one is really has this ripple It has effect. a huge ripple. Anything else we can kind of move around the site and do, you know, switch things around, but this really is required okay. to get the building closed in. Yeah, so that actually, the other things are less risky exactly. overall. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even if and we do have brick, but even if we didn't have the brick, we have the concrete walls, you know, we have styrofoam or insulation on the outside of the building. We can close in the building envelope. Um, it's, it's the roofing that's really the issue at this juncture. So the, the two wings that we will be able to roof, will yeah. we start seeing those actually look like the, build, the buildings enclosed and then the construction will move indoors effectively? Yes, we will. That's uh, been going on this week, as a matter of fact. And uh, we've been working with the mason and the construction manager on the mock-ups of what the actual brick patterns will look like okay. and uh, start moving that forward. So they'll actually do the facings on the building and things yep. like that? Uh, windows, I believe, are coming to the site and being stored in trailers so we have other components to enclose that building envelope at this point. And so uh, this is a curiosity question, sure. not, a, not a formal question. When do you think those uh, those other those wings that we can do will start being enclosed and look enclosed? You know? Well, they're going to they're going to start really in short order now. Um, we're starting to move through those as soon as we get that mock up approved on the masonry and we can say to the mason, go ahead, move along he'll start laying the brick around those first two areas. Okay. So we're, right. we're really, really close. So second big area question. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do, we're going to move the kids in uh, from, uh, from the uh, uh, current Huckleberry at Christmas time effectively or into the beginning of the school, uh, the, the beginning of January into the new school and that's when we're going to start demolishing the existing building. That is correct. Is that a, how disruptive is the demolishing process? The first portion of the demolition process is really going to be internal because we have some abatement to do, right? There's lead, there's PCBs, there's asbestos, um, you know, that's hidden behind walls. It's not out in the open. And that's going to be the first month, month and a half. After that, there's going to be some heavy equipment on there that's going to be knocking down the building. Disruptive. The classroom wings in are the new the building They're are, in the, the, are yep. in the rear. So I don't think it's going to be disruptive to the educational process. Um, I think it's going to be more inquisitive for the kids to kind of see the stuff go on. <laughs> but at that age group, you can guarantee Absolutely. it. <laughs> um, the second question, same kind of question on the that's the Huckleberry is up on a hill right now. With a, I'm presuming there's some amount of leveling in order to get those parking lots in. Yeah. Um, is that an, a, a disruption, a disruptive process? That's also big, heavy equipment. I'm presuming moving a lot of dirt around. No different than the site prep that's been going on from the new building and the heavy equipment that's been moving around. Yeah. And we've had cranes on site picking steel and you know a lot of heavy equipment moving earth and digging for foundations. And the kids have taken it all in stride. Okay. They, they've been really good with this. All right. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, and a question for uh, Dr. Burrell, the traffic flow with just the one parking lot um, with parents and buses all coming in, if we walked through how the flows will work and yeah. you know, make sure we don't have the traffic jams up Candlewood Lake Road? Yeah, so so like all of these things, it, it's certainly not going to be perfect, but we are going to make it work the best we can. Deb Jones from the bus company has been out. 
Um, Rob Tenz has been out. Uh, in July or August, Paul sat down with uh, the principals and myself, uh, along with Deb, and we started really going through the, with Rob uh, Tenza, right. the construction manager, counting the, the parking spaces for grades two through five, which was the original plan to make sure I think it was 116 or 123. We landed on the uh, proper number so we'd have visitor spaces. So we believe we'll be able to make that work um, and uh, continue to, to plan uh, for that. Okay. Based on that. Um, Second logistics question sure. is if I think of two, three, and four as the grades, mm -hmm. doesn't that put one of the grades downstairs and two upstairs? Yeah, and we in in exactly, Bob. So you know, um, uh, three, four, five on the top is kind of the the alignment left yeah. to right we would do. So it would be, and then one, two. Uh, K, K one two on the bottom, so two would be on one side if they, to get to so the you final. So you two and an empty five up above. Exactly. And three and uh, you got two, it. You're visualizing three and four it. over. And we don't want to ask our you know the teachers below. to set up classrooms you know two different times and that kind of a thing. So but that that's, that's the initial thought right now is to set it up upstairs, that way. Given the upstairs downstairs administrative structure you had, you have figured out how you'll be able to deal with that half a year. Exactly, and and again we'll work with uh, with Principal Labrashano on uh, on that. And, and also with uh, with the teachers you know the staff may say hey you know for this half a year we won't we don't mind having the classrooms adjusted and moved in the summertime we'd rather be up with everybody else yeah, so we that, can be together you like know that. so th that's part of the communications and working together with everybody is getting input because sometimes like I found out yesterday in, in the pre-k uh, to, to five uh, work some of the teachers were sharing, the Huckleberry teachers were sharing with me, they were more interested in watching the welding than the kids out at recess. And, and so they, they, they were all through the fence looking at this great welding and all the sparks going off. And the kids were like, nah, we don't, we've seen it already. It's yeah, no big deal. Yeah. So um, you just never know where people are coming from. So and you need big heavy equipment. You get the big heavy equipment the kids are Oh, interested. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so. It's fantastic. Um, great, thank you though, Bob. And then my, my last question, I'll let everybody else ask questions, is it's actually for you and, and uh, Mr. Post. Um, does anything that you've described tonight impact our state bonding? Do I, we have to go? Do we have to go through a communications process with the state, given a delay in the in the opening times, or is that uh, kind of a normal process? Paul, you look like you wanted to start with the answer there. Well, so. state bonding, as far as the um, financing yeah. and the bonding, yeah. no. Um, you know, we we've, we've been in communication with the state. Uh, we actually have a meeting with them. I think on the sixteenth to talk about FF and E and that budget process, but they're well aware of, um, the, supply you know, chain of the supply chain issues. I'm it's guessing we're not the only school with this uh, No, issue. Uh, unfortunately we're not, Brookfield's not unique in this one this okay. time. Uh, I know we're unique. I just unique didn't want to have a situation time. where timelines kind of got right. uh, bollocked up with what the states agreed to or not agreed to and we get into some sort of, right. uh, we promised you a big percentage of the cost of the school, but, uh, but guess what? It's you know you didn't make the dates. No, the, so. the dates weren't. Um, the dates were really internal to our district. The state doesn't sign off on. You need to have this done by. Okay, so there's no date. Uh, no. no date date guidance. Okay. No, I mean look, if we got into a situation where this stretched out for six years for one reason or another, the state would yeah. start to look at us and say, hey guys, but um, okay. you know two three months four months, it's routine for construction. Okay. Unfortunately. Got it. Okay. And that's all that's all the questions I had. Mention about the move management services. Sure, please pull. Doc Girl uh, mentioned that. We did purchase through um, Arcadis, our owner's project manager, move management. Now we will do that now in two phases. And you know, yes, there'll be a minor um, financial impact, but they will handle that entire process for the district, go in, instruct teachers on what needs to be boxed, provide the boxes how to label them, you know, teacher XYZ, grade two classroom, they will move everything that that teacher boxes up, bring it to the new classroom, desks will be set up, cubbies will be installed, all the teacher will need to do is then unpack the boxes. Okay. And, and that's why we would build in the time in the in the calendar for them to be able to do that. Sure, that does that. That can be, uh, just the unpack and it's, pack is a It's a, it's a lot of work. That's a big right. deal for a teacher. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, what happens to the old F and F? The old uh, F and F? Yeah, it just gets tossed. And yeah, the, the district does have first right of um, salvage for anything that they want to salvage, use, or reuse in any of the existing buildings. 
the equipment, technology, desks, everything that's going into the new building is going to be new, and that's what the town hall. Yeah, I know. I just was, you know, if, the, if there's if there's anything that was uh, donatable, sellable, what uh, or the like, you know, yeah. there there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of organizations out there who would love to have some tables or desks or chairs. Absolutely. And, you know, having an opportunity in that little window from when you've exited the building to do yeah. it to let your local yeah. charitable organizations maybe come look at what's there and, and, and take it before we throw it in the dumpster would be yeah. a, a very good public service. And I, I think another thing that's important for, for the public to, to know is tomorrow, as a matter of fact, the, the um, Mrs. Baldwin, our special education supervisor, pre, pre K to five, as well as Principal Labrachano and Principal Diamond, are meeting with myself and uh, Eddie from Tecton, and we're actually going to talk about what equipment and specific furniture for all different needs is appropriate. This includes physical education equipment, right? You're not just going to get rid of all that beautiful equipment. You bring that over, um, uh, but a lot of the basics, like student desks and things like that, will be brand new in the building. So we're going to go through a discerning process there. And that's actually scheduled for tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there is a particular to um, OTPT. Oh, some yeah. new equipment that you had purchased already in the past sure. year or so. And that equipment will be reutilized. Very specific equipment for Very specific, specific student equipment. needs. Yeah. yeah, that would make sense. That yeah. would make sense. Uh, so, so anything that's relatively new, you would want to say, mm -hmm. could we use it? So. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I just keep thinking, I, we did this when I closed down a bunch of facilities with a company I work for. And we made a public day. It wasn't a long, drawn-out thing. It was uh, bring your. Uh, what we do on Saturday, they did a come walk through the building, and on, and and if you're interested, we'll put your uh, you can claim it, and you have to have it out there out of there by Monday, right? You figure out your trucking, right? Whatever you want to do, and you know what? File cabinets, uh, uh, and we let employees in there. Right, mm -hmm. and employees wanted some of that stuff. Sure. So, mm -hmm. um, and so it just a, it's just a really goodwill building exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we just have to be ensured that every document and piece of paper is out. Is out mm -hmm. yeah. for privacy concerns, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you'd be surprised at what gets left behind. Oh God, yes, uh, not surprised at all. Yeah. <laughs> you got to remember the company I work for; it has very secretive documents yes, for, uh, for, uh, for technical design and uh, that we spent all we, we actually had an army of employees going through everything and you know the filing cabinet you found the piece of paper on down on the bottom right you know that kind of stuff so sorry I I've dominated the questions I, no, apolo I apologize to the board <laughs> no 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 Dr. Burrell made me wait two hours. He told me to be here at 7.30. Y'all better ask at least one question. By the, by the way, I think it was one hour, Paul. But, but Paul yeah, tells me. You told me to come at 7.30. Well, I said, really said 7.45. You wanted to come no, early, no, no, wasn't no. it? I have the text that said you better come early. <laughs> we'll be moving through this agenda. He's going to make me He's gonna make me present at the next NBC meeting now to pay, pay back. So if um, Dr. Burrell is going to quote me, the, the actual quote is, um, and I use it with my clients, in three to five years, nobody's going to remember that the building opened three months, four months. They'll remember if it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's just kind of take our time, let's do, do, it, it, right. do it right, mm -hmm. make the move correct, and move on. Yep. How about this? We're having a soft opening in yes. January yes, exactly. and a grand yeah. opening in September. Yep. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. That's how you explain it to everybody. Jen, mm -hmm. I think you might have the time to plan that event. You can plan all those ribbon no, cuttings. What do you think? <laughs> no? No? <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any, any other questions? questions? No. We will be, and I know uh, Rose has been yeah. asking me about walkthroughs and everything, and we were doing it just before the NBC meetings, obviously with the time getting short in the evenings. We're going to try to um, schedule a Saturday and invite yeah. the Board of Ed to start going through. The tough thing is when the site's open, it's mm -hmm. an active construction site. And we want to make sure that we're not impeding their progress, and at the same time, we're all safe. So we'll let you know that. We all saved our helmets, so we're good. Oh, that's good. And us, yeah. I'm wondering <laughs> if. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, there's a way to involve the fourth graders who will not get to go to the new mm -hmm. school. Um, maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking of like maybe have them design a mural or something that'll go to the school. Some. I don't know, help with, um, 
uh, I know that um, both both uh, specifically the the administration and the team at uh, at Huckleberry and Mr. Renda and his team were thinking of making it very special. Yeah. Uh, the tran- the transition itself and and the other opportunities there. So I don't know what those ideas are yet, but they talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the kids going to fifth grade in particular. We're expecting to be able to enjoy the new school, and now they won't. So we have that's to think the, about that's that. That's where that's where that's there's that's what I'm not exactly yeah. we have, we can't forget that. There's, we have a, to there's think, an that's underlying where disappointment. So disappointment. Let's find something special for them. Exactly. And um, the portables at the middle school will be demolished once that fifth grade class then moves to sixth grade. You you bring up a great point. After the building right is complete and we move fifth grade into the new elementary school, then the portables will be taken down. We have some ball fields that we need to construct mm-hmm. and realign at both West Canyon and other sites that we're still studying in town. Um, there's a lot more to this than just the new school building. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. That's important. That yeah, and you everybody know everybody knows that we haven't forgotten about that portion. Mm-hmm. And another piece to this is the, the lead time, not only for the budget, but I did forget to mention as I was moving through the the, the slides quite quickly, is you know there's a, a lead time that that Principal Renda needs in terms of building his schedule. You know, it looks very different when it's six through eight versus five through eight. Yeah. And so it's not only the impact on staff and families and all that. There's that the schedule physically looks different. And Dr. Ruby was actually talking about. The, you know the, the way the classes break down so there's just this is a ripple on every level so it's a lot of logistical planning it just takes time yeah and and uh, so we're going to take advantage of the time we have to be even more intentional all right any other questions no i'm dismissed <laughs> thank you so thanks much for coming paul thank you paul appreciate, appreciate it. it all right uh our next item is public comment. We don't have anybody signed up for tonight. Um, so we are on to three main points. And I would suggest this, this, this discussion. That's only, a very we only <laughs> had really three main things on our agenda. Um, we had all of the, all of the uh, um, class size reports. I, yeah, I was thinking we would kind of put a section for Dr. Ruby <laughs> with class size report. Um, all the reports can really everything that Dr. Ruby together, recorded yeah. in one, you know, one point. Mm-hmm. I thought the Huckleberry Spotlight, yeah, that would nice. be yeah. good to lead off. That would with. be really nice, yeah. And then obviously the, the Candlewood, Candlewood Lake, Lake Elementary, sure. which yeah. I would put first. Yeah, yeah, I would do that number yeah. one. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's a very important yeah. bit of information. Yeah. And it's probably people might have missed that they watched tonight. Cause and and yeah. you can't yeah. capture some of the input that we got and the flavor of it in just uh, looking at a presentation or getting an email. Um, letting people go see the video, well, listening to Paul and this discussion about what's going on with chemical plants in Texas. There's some learning there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, upcoming events. Okay. Uh, Center School has a PTO meeting virtual on Tuesday, November 9th at 7 o'clock. On Thursday, November 11th, they have their virtual Veterans Day assembly. That'll be streamed starting at 920. On Friday, November 12th, they celebrate World Kindness Day. On Thursday, November 18th is picture retake. And Monday, November 22nd is the community meeting. Huckleberry has Tuesday and Wednesday, November 9th and 10th, the second grade field trips to the Firehouse and Kids Kingdom. Thursday, November 11th, they have their virtual Veterans Day assembly. Tuesday, November 23rd is picture retake day. And Monday, November 29th, report cards are available. Wiskineer, end of the first marking period, Tuesday, November 9th. Wednesday and Thursday, November 10th and 11th is early release for conferences. Picture retakes are Tuesday, November 16th, and they have PTO on Wednesday the 17th. Brookfield High School has picture retakes tomorrow. And Wednesday and Thursday, November 10th and 11th, they also have early release for conferences. And all schools will have early release on Wednesday the 24th and close Thursday the 25th and Friday the 26th for Thanksgiving recess. That's it. Thank you. Um, Anybody else with any upcoming events? I know sometimes we have like little drop in ones. All right. Um, So that's it. So without objection, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Mm